Oh. <laughs> I was thinking, oh, at least I'm not one of these tall people who you only see their chin. I'm so sure that I, you don't even see the top of my head. <laughs> well, good morning, everyone. That uh, I'm uh, Margaret Docker from the University of Manitoba. That uh, this, all the student presentations yesterday, I feel really uh, sort of uh, raised the bar for the rest of us today, and then particularly with the. Uh, sort of interactive game that we all uh, ended the afternoon with. Uh, I, I thought that a really nice way to start this morning would be to play an interactive Kahoot uh, quiz to sort of review the, the, the talks, all the wonderful talks that we saw yesterday. So if, if you're familiar with Kahoot, uh, uh, you, you know what to do. If you aren't familiar with it, you can play along on your own device. You just www.kahoot.it or just use the QR code and uh, and then put in the, the game pin. And you don't have to use your real name when it's asking for uh, name or although it's fine if you do. Yeah. And unfortunately, there's no cash prizes. <laughs> I won't be coming oh. around at the end with a, <laughs> with an envelope of cash for, for people, but uh, you will be able to have the pride of, of doing well. Which... Some of the <laughs> <laughs> oh, I don't see a lamprey up there. That's always my go to. Yeah. Okay, and when it looks like we maybe. Oh, there we go. My hint was, uh, was, was picked up on. Okay, anybody still trying to, to get in? Should we wait or are we ready? Let me. Uh... <laughs> okay, well, maybe we'll get we'll get started. So just five five questions. Let me know. Oh, I was gonna say, I'll read it out. The most frequently discussed persistent and innate challenge identified in the survey by Howarth and Al was. <laughs> Very good. Political meddling does it does sound like it might be legitimate. Yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, what's the next? <laughs> okay. Which fish species was not detected by eDNA in Fundy National Park? These are hard questions. <laughs> <laughs> the picture is a hint. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, red belly days. In whose presentation was this very cool logo displayed? Oh, <laughs> I noticed it. <laughs> yes, very good. Yes, the, the, the larval fish, metaphor. Boy, Eric is rocking Which of the following Gen Fish HQP talked about this fish yesterday? Oh, <laughs> 
Yes, all of the above. And final question. So what is an STP chip? Science transfer project chip? <laughs> Stress response transfer. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. So Bob came in third. And Eric. <laughs> Now for, for, for maybe a little bit less interactive, but more informative or as informative, I hope. Oh, oh okay, perfect, thank you. Yes, so, so today we'll be, uh, well this morning at least, yeah, we'll be uh, going through the, the five activity leads for the, the, the GenFish uh, project. Uh, we'll go through uh, a probably very quick overview and, and, and progress updates on sort of the, the three components of the, the GenFish mandate. So I'll start off by talking about activity one and Dr. Nick Mandrak will talk about the second component, activity two of the FISH survey toolkit. And then activities three and four, uh, Drs. Ken uh, Jeffries and, and Daniel Heath will talk about the FISH health toolkit. And then activity five, the activity five lead, Dr. Tina Semenyuk, I will talk about the decision guiding toolkit. I'm just trying to advance it, there we go. Okay, so so activity one, so this is the, 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 the development and the initial testing of the, the FISH uh, uh, survey toolkit that it uh, involves six different labs, uh, coast to coast, uh, going from uh, Dr. Mark Shrimpton's lab at UNBC to Dr. Scott Pavey's lab at UNB, and uh, uh, involving you know, a large number of, of HQP, many of whom you uh, heard yesterday. And so that what I'll just be doing then is giving that sort of quick overview, sort of sampling a lot of the work that uh, all of the different HQP are doing to try to put it into the context of the activity one uh, as, a, as a whole. So as I said, this is the development of the, the FISH uh, survey toolkit consisting of these three different uh, objectives. So objective uh, one led by uh, Dr. Bob Hanner at the University of Guelph is the um, development of robust and validated eDNA assays for all freshwater fishes of Canada. And so that involves both uh, species specific uh, assays for single species and the meta barcoding or community eDNA approach that you heard uh, about yesterday. Uh, the second objective led by uh, Dr. Brian Neff at uh, Western is using environmental microsatellite DNA, which I'll uh, talk about a little bit uh, later for uh, quantification of a, of a select number of species of interest. And then in the, the third objective led by Daniel Heath um, using the same sort of eDNA but, uh, uh, species identification approach, but rather than using water samples, doing it on stomach contents to be able to look at predator prey uh, relationships. So just to sort of uh, to put things into perspective, I know that uh, Rena talked about this yesterday and there were a few other uh, HQP did as well. So that there's three sort of uh, basic steps to the uh, development and, and initial validation. The first is the in silico analysis sort of on a computer where we uh, look at the computer sequences to predict uh, what assays will be uh, species uh, specific, you know, uh, amplifying DNA from target species and not amplifying it from the, the non-target species. 
Then the second part is the in vitro, which literally means in glass, but referring to, you know, in a tube, in a lab, where you use tissue-derived DNA to test the, the assays that you've designed uh, in silico. And then the, the third step is in situ, in place, in the field, testing it uh, in water bodies where we know the species does occur and doesn't occur to see if uh, it's uh, working as predicted. So this is just sort of the this involves that initial in silico uh, validation, that large scale in, in uh, sorry in situ, the large scale in situ validation will come as part of activity two. Oops. Yes, and then the other really critical part of this, and this is what has certainly taken us much longer than we anticipated when we uh, sort of envisioned this project is all of this uh, analysis and uh, testing to uh, ensure that assays amplify only the species of interest and not the, the non-target species requires that a really, really robust data database, both of uh, sequences for all of the, the freshwater fishes of Canada and, and then also uh, reference tissue collections, either to fill in the sequence gaps for the, the first part or to use for that in vitro uh, testing. So again, I'm just going to like sample from uh, a lot of the different uh, HQP projects throughout the, the, the GenFish team. And so Stephen Rogers from uh, Guelph talked about his work uh, yesterday using uh, kind of the sequence alignments of close to, well, close to 40,000 sequences of the, the DNA barcoding CO1 region from uh, Canadian freshwater fishes and uh, confamilial uh, uh, representatives to look and see how well the 101 published CO1 assays are expected to, to work uh, when you look at that really broad sequence comparison. And as he was telling us yesterday, they didn't, at least for broad application across Canada, they don't look like they would work particularly well. That, um, let me just go ahead. Only about 5% of them were predicted to be fully species specific, that no matter where you use them, that they would only amplify target species DNA. Another 20% or so would have been regionally specific so that they would likely work fine um, because they didn't, they don't co-occur, at least in Canada, with uh, the non-targets that are cross-amplifying. And then uh, the remaining 75% or so uh, more likely to uh, yield false positives detecting something other than the species that you want or false negatives missing the species that you want. So this then, uh, first of all, sort of that uh, inability then to just use those published assays for Canadian uh, freshwater fishes. And then because there are so many gaps that so many of our uh, uh, fish species don't have any assays for them, we've had to sort of start from uh, the, the, the beginning ourselves and develop and, and validate these assays. And so this is by far the, the, the largest part, uh, at least in terms of the number of people involved. So we have multiple HQP from the five different labs, coast to coast, all participating in 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 this uh, uh, this endeavor and so so far out of, we've uh, identified 218 uh, species on our on our sort of our hit list and we have um, assays designed for 184 at least co1 assays designed for 184 of those species um, for sorry 184 assays for 146 species so in a couple of cases uh, redundant assays and uh, site b24 so far and so where we're going, uh, and this is sort of one of the end products of, of uh, GenFish, will be to have these well-validated assays that we can share with the, the, the community, that there'll be a, a web-based um, uh, database that uh, people can access sequences, protocols, and even uh, request um, trial aliquots of, of primers and probes to test to see if they work um, for, your, for your needs before investing in them your, yourself. And so I've talked about the, the single species targeted assays where the goal is to design primers that are that match only with the, the target species DNA, so it only amplifies the target species. Metabarcoding or community community eDNA barcoding is the sort of the opposite approach where you try to have primers that are universal that will amplify any the DNA from any fish species in the water, and then you uh, use high throughput sequencing to sequence the amplicon to identify it. 
And so both the Hanner Lab and the Heath Lab have been working on um, optimizing or developing uh, metabarcoding protocols that will be optimized for Canadian freshwater fishes. So in the Hanner Lab, and Erica was talking about this uh, yesterday, testing existing um, metabarcoding primers to see how well they work for Canadian freshwater fishes. And one of the, the, the problems so far is that sort of taxonomic blind spot where you might, for example, uh, get a sequence, but we can't match it up to a particular species in the database because that species hasn't yet been sequenced in the uh, and put into the database. And, uh, and then in the, the Heath Lab, trying uh, to redesign metabarcoding primers that will amplify a larger chunk of uh, eDNA because part of the problem, particularly for closely related species, is if you have a very small fragment, closely related species are going to be identical in that small fragment. The idea being if you have a larger chunk of DNA, you will be able to uh, resolve uh, closely related species. And so uh, looking at three different uh, genes, uh, the, 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 the Heath group has been uh, trying to, to uh, do this approach. Oops. And so, so far with uh, the, the 12S gene, um, they've uh, redesigned some, some primers that will amplify chunks that are, you know, 350, 320 base pairs nearly universal by the looks of things. Pretty much everything but lampreys are, are amplifying reliably. Sea lamprey is amplifying a little bit, but even the, the, the non-teleost bony fishes like uh, you know, sturgeon, bowfin, uh, gars are, are working with this. So looking pretty good. And then the next step will be to test on mock eDNA communities to make sure it's detecting everything that it should be detecting and ideally being able to estimate relative abundance by looking at the relative number of reads for different species. And then just to sort of go back to that, you know, the, the, the sort of the, the, the foundation of a lot of this work is making sure that we have really good uh, tissue uh, collections and sequences for all of the species so that we can really design and test all of these um, assays very well. And so we've been uh, working uh, quite hard with a lot of uh, partners on, on GenFish to try to really make sure that we have a well-populated uh, reference tissue collection that it represents not just all of the, the species that we're interested in, but has good geographic coverage across Canada so that an assay that we uh, develop for a fish in Manitoba will also work in, in, in BC if the, if the species occurs there. And so again, you know, really uh, working hard on uh, populating this uh, reference tissue collection and also making sure that all of our information is easily accessible and, and fully transparent. So we've got, you know, our little uh, spreadsheet here and you, you know, if you click on the map link, you can find out exactly where on a map that particular reference tissue was collected so that uh, there's that good sort of uh, record of, uh, of collection materials. So then with the, the in vitro testing, that's the, the lab-based testing on tissue-derived DNA, so that of the 184 CO1 assays, 101 are in some stage of, of uh, uh, in vitro testing, about 60 of those are approximately com complete, um, and uh, 24 uh, site B assays have been tested in vitro. Also working on standardizing protocols for assessing things like specificity, species specificity, sensitivity, uh, limit of detection. There's no point, of course, having eDNA assays that are not very sensitive, that the only time you're detecting the fish is when it's basically, you know, jumping all over the place, that you want to be able to have a highly sensitive assay that uh, you can detect uh, species even when they aren't uh, readily uh, uh, apparent and looking at um, interference as well. And one of the things that's really critical, and this is certainly something that, uh, that Stephen and others have seen with some of the published assays, is transparency in reporting. Even if you don't have an assay that's 100% species specific, that at least to be able to report, okay, it was tested against these, you know, 24 species and all but one of them showed no amplification and that 24th showed a little bit or something like that. And so that others can take a look at that list and say, oh, well, that particular non-target doesn't even occur in my region, so I'm, I'm fine. You know, many of the published papers do this, but some it's basically they report a species specific assay, but it's often sort of a, you know, trust me sort of situation that there's no documentation of species specific compared to what. So we're really trying to sort of standardize um, that, that uh, reporting um, aspect. 
And then the the in situ testing. This is part of the, the part that is, is quite fun because we're working with a lot of really uh, uh, engaged partners. And so uh, Rena talked about some of the in situ testing she did in uh, uh, Fundy National Park. Um, and, uh, and and Brooklyn and uh, and the, my group uh, has talked talked about the the work they've done at Fort White Alive, where when we know what species are there, we see whether the eDNA assays perform the way we would expect them to. And a couple of other uh, uh, ongoing sort of initial in situ testing uh, at the experimental lakes area. They have a very good record, of course, of what's in each of the the lakes, and so we're using that to to test for for five uh, common fish species. A really fun project that Jesse and I were able to uh, participate in this summer, uh, looking for a deep water sculpin or testing for a deep water sculpin in a, in a deep lake in Quebec where we knew it, it uh, occurred. And uh, work that uh, Mark Shrimpton is doing in, in British Columbia as well, uh, knowing the distribution of four salmonid species and three sculpin species, testing to see whether the um, eDNA assays are performing as we expect them to. Okay, so then objective 1.2. So this is the uh, environmental microsatellite uh, DNA with the idea being that this is a, a, a good um, method or promising method to be able to estimate number of individuals. And uh, Matthew and others were talking yesterday about using eDNA to estimate relative abundance where we can use eDNA signal strength or for metabarcoding a number of reads to estimate relative abundance. Of a, of a fish and particularly with some of the work that Matthew has done, uh, taking into account body size and metabolic rate. I mean, that appears uh, quite promising as well. One of the downsides of using sort of quantity of eDNA to estimate relative abundance is that it's dependent on a lot more than just the abundance of the fish. It also depends on environmental uh, factors. Um, and so the, the uh, environmental micro satellite approach, it's sort of the way I think of it from maybe from the outside, Daniel would be able to explain it perhaps in a different way, but I sort of think of it as, as in terms of a, uh, allele counting. And it's very much like trying to estimate the number of contributors to a blood sample in, in forensics. And so that if you have say four alleles for a, a gene that only occurs at most, two alleles per individual, one from each parent. If you find four alleles in a blood sample, then you know at minimum there were two contributors to that to that blood sample, sort of a maximum four, minimum uh, two. And so this isn't something we're doing for all Canadian freshwater fishes. It's very labor intensive because you have to know sort of the number of alleles in a particular population, but it's very promising for well characterized uh, fish species of interest. And so uh, Brian Neff and, and Daniel Heath, this is something that they have been working on. And so using this um, EM DNA approach to estimate number of individuals of Atlantic salmon. And so um, uh, master's student uh, Simone uh, McClosey has sort of done a series of, of experiments starting off with a sort of a lab experiment where you know exactly how many individuals are there, a uh, stream enclosure going a little bit more in situ, but still a, a known number of individuals to this past summer uh, looking at number of Atlantic salmon individuals in uh, three Ontario tributaries. And just to sort of quickly show you some of the, the, the results. And so, as I said, this depends on a lot more basic knowledge of the sort of uh, number of alleles in a population. But if, you know, looking at three different microsatellite uh, loci, this uh, a simulation on almost 3,000 Atlantic salmon sort of tells us what the relationship is between number of alleles in the water and or in the population and uh, number of individuals. And so to test this in a stream then, sort of looking at three different uh, tributaries before stocking, two to six weeks after stocking, uh, seven to 21 weeks after stocking. And as you can see, at least in the last two uh, streams, that the number of individuals estimated did increase after, after stocking, which is what you'd expect. So a very uh, cool uh, um, uh, application. And then the, the, the final objective uh, in activity one is the uh, stomach content uh, DNA analysis. We're using that same uh, principle of either uh, species specific or in this case, metabarcoding assays to, to look at, to identify to species, you know, what that, you know, uh, often amorphous uh, contents of a, of a stomach uh, might, might be. 
And so this was a match. This is Matt Sharon's master uh, project, master's project at, at the University of Windsor. And one of the challenges with doing um, stomach content DNA analysis is that often the, the predator DNA will sort of overwhelm, often in many cases, the prey DNA because of the, 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 the stomach of the, of the predator itself. And so Matthew was looking at using blocking primers that would block the predator DNA to sort of enhance the, the, the prey DNA. That part itself didn't work particularly well. It looked like the uh, predator blocking primers weren't sufficiently species specific that it was also blocking some of the, 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 the prey. But the process in general worked quite well. This is a very colorful but hard to immediately decipher uh, figure. But what it is is each individual, each vertical line is an individual and then each color is uh, a different prey item within the within the gut and so it's just a, a really nice way especially if you get that sort of as i said that amorphous uh, mass of stomach contents that you don't know what it is you can say okay individual a you know eight 80% round goby, 20% emerald shiner and so it's a really nice way of looking at uh, predator prey uh, interactions And uh, similarly, this is a project that uh, uh, Bob Hanner's group uh, did in collaboration with Parks Canada and the um, Athabasca Chippewyan uh, First Nation uh, community-based monitoring program in the, the Peace Athabasca Delta using metabar coding to look at stomach contents of uh, whitefish. And this was nice because it not it didn't just detect fish species, but it also looked at uh, invertebrate uh, prey in the in the stomach as well. So a lot of uh, possibilities with these methods. And then the last thing I'll I'll, I'll mention too, this is something that uh, is being developed in the in the Heath lab. When you sort of I think of this as this is sort of like that inter, for the intermediate need between a single species assay and the meta bar coding that tells you everything that's in the in the water or in the, the gut contents. The open array chip then allows for individual species specific assays to be arrayed onto a, onto a chip and then you can um, survey uh, samples for say 30 species at a time or something like that. And so um, Matt has been doing this for the stomach content as well. And, uh, and just to give you an idea of sort of the power of it then, you could run you know, 2,688 assays per chip, so 28 stomach content samples for 28 prey species in duplicate, and, and do that um, all, all at once. And as Corey was mentioning yesterday as well, that this, the same can apply to water samples as well. And so he's been doing that for 30 um, species, invasive species, species at risk, as a way of very efficiently surveying for a, a large number of species when you don't quite want to commit to the, the, the metabar coding um, uh, approach. So that, in a nutshell, is activity one. I think we were just going to do the back back to back, or do we want to have quite a few questions in between? I don't. Just back to back. Yes, that's what I was thinking. Time. Yep. I think I'm going to have to adjust the camera. Belly button camera. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
is actually processing those, developing methods to process those samples. That's uh, uh, what the Heath uh, Lab is uh, leading right now with, uh, with Matt Yates and, and, and Jonathan LeBlanc. And the third part is, is to start looking at comparing uh, uh, fish communities based on conventional sampling to our eDNA results. And that could be based on, on historical data, or it could be based on uh, uh, samples of conventional samples that were taken simultaneously or, or relatively close to the eDNA sampling period. And then looking at our master 500 water body data set um, to look at you know, the potential effects of, um, of uh, in, uh, environmental characteristics on uh, eDNA detection and efficacy and reliability. And you can see that uh, in terms of the, the timelines, we, we were working on 500 water bodies from day one we're only now, uh, well, and uh, we're, we're only now getting into actually task 2.1.2, where we can actually process those samples. So we, we do have quite a large backlog of filters, several thousand um, that need to be processed, but we're on the cusp of getting through that back, you know, getting to that black, uh, backlog. And then the, the third task cannot actually uh, take place until we actually start getting data from those backlog filters. So uh, uh, other than, as you'll find out, that uh, Dr. Dr. Sharma has uh, compiled a very large historical uh, fish community database. Uh, so this is where we stand uh, in three years of our 500 water body sampling. Uh, you can, if you add it up, uh, we're over 500 water bodies. So uh, I think we've done really well here. Uh, we've covered, uh, we're only missing one territory, Nunavik. And, uh, uh, you, you know, the, um, the Research Oversight Committee keeps pushing us to, to fill in gaps. And you can, see, you can see that we still have some geographic gaps, uh, but we're making progress on them. The obvious gap, well, uh, sorry, there's two territories. I, I should have added the Yukon because there was plans to sample there this summer and those plans with the, with the, the partner fell through, uh, but uh, we're going to try again next year. And um, I think uh, next year uh, we really, really need to emphasize just working on gaps in this map. Uh, and obviously much of those gap, uh, uh, many of those gaps are, are northern gaps. So um, if you know of any people working in the north, uh, we would love to hear from you. Uh, to, we, I think we really want to be strategic in our targeting next year. And if you just look above 2021, you can see a point up at the um, Canadian High Arctic Research Station uh, where Alex was this summer and collected some samples. And uh, here's uh, Dr. Sharma's database of uh, 800,000 plus uh, fish distribution records uh, for Canada. She's just waiting for our the results of our um, of our uh, lab work to start uh, using those data, uh, along with uh, 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 Dr. Pedro Perez Netes, Netes, uh to uh, analyze the environmental side of of uh, this uh, activity. So we do have uh, a series of case studies and our, our case study list has expanded, which is great as we've added new partners and new interesting questions. Uh, and you, there is a bit of overlap with activity one. And when I come to those case studies, I'll just, I'll just, uh, just uh, pass over them. And you can see there's three parts undertaking the case studies, which we've been doing from the beginning. So we're ahead of the game on that. Um, and then uh, the stomach contents project uh, was you heard uh, from Margaret, and there's a second one with another partner uh, that I'll briefly mention. We're not as far ahead as uh, Matt uh, is. And then uh, towards the end, we want to basically compare results across the case studies to find out what we've learned about. Where does this work? Where does it make sense to use uh, these applications? And what are the challenges? So if you look at this table, uh, the case studies in white are the ones that were in our original proposal. The, the case studies below are the ones that we've added uh, to, um, to, the, the, to uh, GenFish. And you can see that there's a variety of uh, questions being answered in these case studies. 
And uh, basically, I've asked each of the case study leads to uh, send me a slide or two to go over with their case, the, the status, the status of their case study. So I'm just going to go through those slides to give you a flavor of um, the progress on these case studies. And uh, what I've done here, I haven't, uh, was not as organized as, as uh, Margaret with the, the nice photographs and the identification of all the HQP and that doesn't mean I don't appreciate them, but uh, I would suggest, I would suggest that if you're interested in this, you follow up with the, the, the PI lab lead and then they'll put you in touch with the right people. Um, so uh, you can see that the Shrimpton lab is, is uh, doing a pelagic species surveys in, in Williston Lake uh, and they are looking at this um, relationship between uh, eDNA and fish abundance as well as uh, composition and distribution. And uh, they're, they're developing uh, novel assays and they've collected eDNA from multiple deaths and depths and the preliminary results show that there is a positive relationship between eDNA and abundance. Uh, they're doing uh, another study uh, at a counting fence. And the counting fence is great because you actually get a census, right? You get an independent um, count of the number of individuals. So they're looking at the correlation between eDNA and the fish ab abundance as measured at the counting fence for several salmonid species. And uh, again, they've uh, developed uh, novel qPCR assays and, and have been collecting uh, eDNA through the, uh, the, the migration April, July in 2020 and 2021. So uh, the recurring theme that you'll see with most of these case studies, except for I think the next one, is that they're in progress. Uh, the, this one from the Docker lab, that's ma mapping uh, the distribution of endangered carbine shiner, I believe is, uh, is done. And um, uh, they were looking at uh, monitoring uh, range changes related to threats. And they developed uh, two species specific uh, qPCR assays as uh, part of this project. Uh, Markel uh, talked a little bit about this project yesterday when she was saying, uh, talking about the problems with actually uh, bar meta barcoding lipomas, which is a very odd problem. But the bigger picture is uh, that the uh, Fisheries and Oceans Canada classifies streams based on fish communities. And so um, Markel went to these uh, these fish communities in southwestern Ontario, uh, to these drains in southwestern Ontario that, that DFO had sampled uh, uh, using conventional sampling, typically sanding and electrofishing. She sampled uh, the eDNA. And interestingly, basically, she sampled the drains that took them a week in less than a day uh, to get the eDNA samples. And uh, she sampled 15 drains in total. Uh, we're still waiting. We've, we've, we've processed the one site that Markel talked about yesterday, Pickle Drain, where we have the, the issue with uh, Lipomas, uh, and we're still waiting for the results of the rest. But um, it, as you saw yesterday, uh, the compar comparisons are pretty comparable with rare some rare species being detected only by the conventional, like one or two detected only by conventional sampling, and then one or two detected only by uh, eDNA. So it'll be interesting to see what the rest of the results look like. Uh, this is this is the project that uh, Alex talked about yesterday, so um, I, I don't think uh, we need to talk about it any further. Uh, so Alex talked about this in, in some detail. Uh, just, uh, just remind you that there's two elements to this. One is at Bruce Nuclear itself, and one is at the site of a proposed uh, power generation facility at um, a retired art artillery range in Georgian Bay, where there's sense, you know, basically you can't drag a net along the bottom. Uh, so eDNA seems like a, a potential logical uh, solution to, to that. And, and we were using these uh, uh, auto samplers. Uh, this is uh, another project that um, I worked on with the, uh, the MNR and I, I, I forgot to add Mike Rennie from, from uh, Lakehead as well. And so the MNR has a broad scale monitoring program where they, uh, they have systematic uh, gill netting 
in in lakes to, uh, to monitor fish communities over time, including abundance, and they've calibrated uh, the effort to abundance so they can estimate abundance based on their net captures. Well, we use ex the exact same methods to, to take uh, the same number of water samples in the same lakes that they were sampling that year. And uh, we're still at the point where we're waiting for the, the most of the samples to be processed. You can see that there's one lake that was processed in, in our lab, uh, Alex worked on this. And um, uh, um, so uh, we still have to do the, the comparisons. And one of the ideas we have is to start looking at the effort required to, um, to sample lakes for, um, for uh, uh, presence and abundance and start doing things like detection probability analyses uh, to determine uh, the sampling effort required. And, and this would be a good data set to, to uh, uh, use to look at that question. Uh, so this is uh, this is Matt's project and, and uh, Margaret has gone over it, so I won't repeat that. And uh, we're doing a second uh, stomach contents DNA project with uh, Nawash First Nations and the Ministry of Natural Resources. And like uh, the Lake Erie Fisheries Assessment Unit of MNR, Lake Huron has a ton of frozen fish with lots of sample uh, with a lot of uh, stomachs to be sampled and they've been sampling it. And the key question for Nawash is are the the lake trout they're being reintroduced into uh, Lake Huron feeding on the lake whitefish that they are har want to harvest. Uh, so uh, we've had uh, um, uh, Alex has started working on this project. Alex is the go-to person, obviously, the jack of all trades and the Alex of all trades in our lab. Uh, we have been looking for uh, a dedicated uh, master's, of pro uh, preferably a PhD student for this project. So if anyone's interested in a, their their next project, uh, we do have a position available for this and. And it's not just for this project itself, but we um, we have several uh, stomach contents projects like uh, flathead catfish is a new invader that gets to be about a meter long. It's only found in the Thames River, which is not far from here. That's the only place it's found in Canada. We need to know what it's eating. Uh, we've, I've dis dissected some stomachs, then they're eating big fish, but we don't know what they are. Uh, so that would be an example of a, a project that we have ongoing in the lab uh, and in, in need of um, some HQP. Uh, again, this is uh, Alex's project um, uh, uh, and, and a, a, a graduated student, Kavi Galaj, uh, started working on this as well, uh, detecting invasive and endangered fishes using ichthyoplankton. Uh, this, was, this was put into uh, GenFish as, to be an early win because we were starting to work on this before GenFish started. And, and we actually, uh, Cavi graduated in 2020 with the endangered fish side of this. Uh, so it's a really, um, you know, um, the results were really interesting. And I like what Alex is doing at taking to the next level to compare the larval samples to the eDNA samples, right? So we're still waiting uh, to get the permission to do that type of sampling at, at Bruce Nuclear. Uh, Markel is working on her main project is actually this project where she's working with uh, Saugeen Ojibwe Nation and uh, they are sampling uh, 13 wetlands on the Saugeen Peninsula which is about three or four hours north of here uh, on that peninsula between Lake Huron and Georgian Bay and they're concerned about the uh, the wetland health as it relates to things like Bruce Nuclear. And uh, there is a wetland health index uh, that is of uh, biotic integrity that uses fishes. And we are, well, Markel will be comparing the, the wetland index scores between the conventional sampling and the eDNA sampling to see if eDNA sampling could ultimately replace the conventional sampling. And not unlike the experience that Markel had with with um, with the drains, when we couldn't go out together with the uh, Saugeen Ojibwe crew in 2020, Markel and I would drive up once a week and sample all the sites they they took a week to sample. So again, if 
if the the results are comparable, we are saving quite a bit of time, and, and as would the Saugeen Ojibwe Nation if they were to adopt environmental DNA. This year, uh, Markel was actually embedded with the crew, so she went out and spent the full week with them. Um, but uh, uh, we know that the, the eDNA sampling alone can be done uh, in a single day uh, compared to a week. Uh, okay, and then this is uh, in the NEF lab, and uh, Margaret had gone over this case study. And then uh, Ian Smith talked a little bit about his, his goldfish study where we're taking advantage of, uh, and he's in, in uh, Hugh McIsaac's lab, and, and I co-supervise him. We're taking advantage of the fact that they're draining goldfish ponds. Well, ponds that contain goldfish are not meant to be goldfish ponds. In the Hamilton area, and as they're being drained, we can actually count the actual number of goldfish in there. The scary thing is some of them have over 100,000 goldfish. Uh, and that's that's a pond that's the size of like a, not even a football field, right? And the even scarier thing is they went back the following year and found tens of thousands of goldfish in the pond that they had drained. <laughs> so we don't know what's going on. That sort of beyond, that's beyond uh, genfish, and it leads to some other interesting questions about invasive species and, and goldfish physiology. But the idea here is that we're actually going to uh, compare uh, abundant, we can compare abundance estimates against the total census, right? And the interesting thing, and uh, Ian uh, showed it yesterday, is like you, it's very difficult to sample, even conventionally sample in, in these systems. The reason why they want to drain them is to dredge them because they're so deep in, in muck. Uh, so it's very difficult to just wade in there and, and pull a seine. So um, uh, we've developed a, a, an aerial drone method for, for sampling uh, water as well uh, in, in these ponds. And Ian is actually, I think, uh, now has his drone license so he can do it himself. Uh, and so 37 ponds were sampled. Ian has spent a lot of time in the field, 10 of which have been drained, so we'll have be able to do the comparisons for 10. The biggest thing right now is counting the goldfish. And uh, so uh, DFO right now probably has several hundred thousand goldfish in their labs that they want to get rid of, and they keep bugging us to come and count them. Um, and then interestingly, other fish are showing up too. Chinook are showing obviously that these ponds are connected to the wild, uh, as is probably the long nose scar, and then uh, various sunfish are showing up in the ponds as well. And you may have seen some stories about uh, these ponds because of pictures like that goldfish at the bottom. It really catches people's attention. So it was, the goldfish issue has been in the in the media quite a bit this um, this summer. And then the nice thing about Ian's work is he's doing seasonal resampling as well. Uh, and then uh, just an example of how systematically uh, we are uh, well, Ian sampling the ponds. And then actually I was thinking this probably should have went under um, the one of the previous uh, tasks. It's actually developing the methods to 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 um, analyze all of these uh, all of these uh, filters that we have in the lab. And, and this is being led by by Matthew Yates and, and Jonathan LeBlanc. And uh, so uh, we're almost there. We're almost at the point where we can start doing uh, mass extractions and uh, analyses, just about there. And one last thing uh, coming out of this this uh, activity is uh, a paper that looks at the, um, the the current challenges and opportunities to using uh, environmental DNA in freshwater fisheries management and conservation. The paper is in major revision. Uh, the comments are readily addressable, and we expect to submit, resubmit any day now. So this will likely be accepted in the near future. And I think that's it. So did you and Margaret have about, what is it, eight minutes? Yeah. Eight minutes to answer questions. Okay. non-specific amplification that aren't necessarily phylogenetically uh, closely related. And I think our conventional wisdom in assay development is, yeah, 
yeah, make sure you get the time generics, and that's probably good enough for specificity. I'm not sure it is. We've also heard that, um, at least for CO1, we can't design assays for a lot of the invaders because the variation just isn't there. Mm -hmm. So I think that's one of the questions that we have is, you know, Daniel's lab has been working to generate that 12S data set and uh, site B, and we're just kind of wondering if we get an update on when some of that data might be shareable so we can keep working on more assays. I think that's a question yeah. for Margaret or Dan. Yeah, but um, I can't remember. We have tissue now for, I think, all of the native species, and then there are like 25 invasives that are already established or are imminent that the list of 40 potential invasives, we have virtually no tissue samples for the bamboo. That's that was more of a next next uh, problem. We're getting, yeah, so that we've got most of the, the, the species now, we're getting good geographic coverage of, of most of the species. I think that like there are 680 species by biogeographic zone combinations and we have about 54% of that. So we're, we're filling in that geographic variation as well. And so then I think then that uh, the samples have been working their way to, to Windsor. Ted has been doing uh, extractions, and so that I think that I know we've been saying this for a while, but it's, I think everything is in place now for that very efficient filling in of the, the, the sequences. And I think probably what is critical there, yeah, is if there's things that we should be prioritizing for your needs, yeah, let us let us let us know. Um, but I think yeah, and, and what you're saying too about the sometimes just by chance you get non-target answers that isn't predictable. It's not even that you say the gene necessarily, it's just something else that's amplifying, not necessarily a closely related species. One other thing that I didn't mention in my presentation with the validation is even with the in silico, in vitro, and in situ validation, it's always good um, for in situ amplification to sequence at least a sequence a, a subsample of the aliquots. And so when you, you know, amplify something from the water, in silico and in vitro testing tells you it should be specific, but then the, 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 the sort of the gold standard then is to, to sequence what you actually pull up with those primers to make sure that it is indeed the target, not the non-target. That's sort of the, the final the final step. Because yet sometimes you just amplify something you didn't anticipate at all. It's just the, the luck of the draw. Yeah, I mean anecdotal Chris Wilson has shared a, a story that uh, they someone had developed a, a targeted assay. Uh, for state that they were applying it all over New York and finding it everywhere, putting everyone on high alert, and it was actually cross amplifying the small and fast. And that really kind of undercut the editor's confidence in the mm -hmm. data. You know, yeah. So that's something we really have to be careful about. Yeah. Uh, so people don't throw the data on the battle. Yes, yes. And that's, yeah, because that came up when I was at a, at a science transfer board meeting. It was the GLSC, and I was overhearing people talking about that case. And, and, and the managers were really in a difficult situation because that they didn't, they didn't even know sort of what questions they should be asking. So if a, um, you know, a private lab or a, a, a university lab runs a sample of again, so what I was referring to as the, you know, trust me, you know, we we tested it at species specific trust us, and that the fisheries managers didn't know what questions to ask. And so I was saying, well, did they sequence the amplicons? You know, what did they tested against? And like, well, we, we don't know. And so that this is what's led to one of the, the GLSC science transfer projects that we're doing right now that, that, that Chris is leading and Paige is a, a part of as well, that we're trying to sort of come up with a checklist so that managers who themselves don't have experience with eDNA can say, okay, did you seek with amplicons? Did you do this? Did you do that? And that uh, they can determine whether whether they, you know, put everybody on, on high alert, have the entire crew out for the next month electrofishing um, streams looking for, for snakehead, uh, or whether they, yeah, do that. Just wanted to make a point about uh, phylogenetic relatedness because it came up a few times. Um, I'm on the FS Names Committee and we've just um, revised our the, the decadal revision of our list, there are massive changes in phylogenetic relationships among fishes. 
And if you want the current relationships, you should look it up on Eschmeyer's catalog of fishes online. But they're massive. They, they get, it's, it's, it's incredible how much has changed in terms of the relationship of fishes. So if you're looking for a closely related species, don't go to the literature, go to Eschmeyer's catalog of fishes. And that's really a good point because I'm not sure if some of you have worked with the species list and you might see those uh, species identification numbers where using an older classification, yeah. I set it up so that it was like the order, family, and, and, and species, that there were numbers because I mean, it's easy to identify con generic species because they have the same genus name, but, but you know, family and order is a little bit more difficult. And so what I can do then is like that, that using that updated information uh, I can, you know, with the input from, from Nick, uh, sort of update that that numbering system so that all of all of you don't necessarily have to know all the ins and outs of the latest uh, phylogeny, but that that helps. And it's really important, I think, as well for activity three and four that that uh, you're wanting to know, okay, well, what's in the same subfamily, family, order, mm -hmm. subclass, yet being able to just do that hierarchical sorting without, uh, without knowing all the ins and outs. So, Nick, did a switch happen above the genus level? When you say master? Yeah, it, it is catastrophic. <laughs> <laughs> nice. um, I did see a hand back there. Yes. Margaret, you mentioned that the, uh, the reference tissue collection database will be more widely available. Will it be publicly available or just available to managers? Uh, the goal is to, for it to be publicly available. I believe that everything that, that we develop is eventually meant to be fully available to, to, to anybody. That it doesn't necessarily mean that, so that all of the information, our, our list of assays, our tissues will be available, doesn't necessarily mean that anybody can get an aliquot of, of primers or, or tissues sent to them, but that information should, yeah, will be, uh, yeah. Okay, so we'll, this issue came up in previous focus groups and the focus group yesterday with um, endangered, threatened species. Will that information be held back? Yes, we, yeah, I'm glad you see it. We haven't necessarily thought all the way through to that yet, but yeah, there are definitely already data sensitive species like through, you know, in Kasiewicz status reports and, and other uh, things where that there are certain species where collection information is kind of like almost like pixelated out in sort of general area, but not any specific so that people couldn't go and poach that. And so that we would be following those sorts of uh, already existing um, uh, criteria for, for, for data sensitive species. Thank you. Yeah, and if I can just add that, yeah, and that the, the uh, data management uh, sort of system that Cam was talking about uh, yesterday, one of the things that's really important as well is the, the provenance of, of samples. And just like knowing, for example, if we're sharing you know, tissue or DNA with somebody that we have ha we have permission from the original provider to, to then share it further, that, that making sure that we aren't, yeah, that we have all of the agreements, I know a good record of everything to make sure that we're not uh, uh, going beyond what the original intent was of, of people who provide tissues. We'll have more time uh, after lunch and we'll discuss further. Thank you. I'm working right away. <laughs> All right. Perfect. Um, okay, so I'll be just giving you an update on activity three, which is the development of the uh, fish health toolkit. So just an overview of the approach here. Um, the idea is to try to develop a universal uh, TAC and uh, qPCR assays for uh, 42 target uh, freshwater fishes in Canada. Uh, the approach has been to, first of all, go after a, a target a bunch of genes that are representative of responses to various types of uh, relevant uh, environmental stressors for the fish. Uh, and then we started compiling the transcriptomic resources for these uh, target genes uh, for our 42 uh, target 
species. Now, we can do this from a variety of different ways. Sometimes it requires a little, quite a bit of effort to find these things. So they can be either available through public databases or there are uh, assembled transcriptomes that are associated with published studies or uh, we've had to go and uh, actually do the sequencing ourselves and develop the, the sequence information for the, some of the target species for uh, the GenFish project. And if I'm counting correctly, through projects associated with GenFish PIs or, and ones that we've specifically sequenced ourselves and or we're going to sequence, that's about 15 of this target species will have generated the, the actual um, uh, transcriptomic resources for those the, through the GenFish project. And so then once we have those all uh, compiled, then what we've been doing is aligning the sequences together to look for conserved regions in these genes between the different species. And from there, we can start to design the, the qPCR assays. And the qPCR assays are targeting the mRNA expression of these particular genes. And then from there, we can design the, the qPCR assay and then do the, the actual testing. And what we found is that uh, this is quite challenging to do this across uh, different groups of fishes. So we've started focusing on some specific uh, uh, species specific or order specific chips and so designing ones that are, are you know specific towards salmonids was our, our first attempt and this makes a lot of sense because there are a lot of studies uh, towards salmonids within the group and they're arguably the most economically important group of species but we also have plans for uh, sturgeon specific chips lamprey specific chips uh, minnows and persiforms as well but uh, the ultimate goal is to try to make these assays as universal as possible so that they work across as many different groups of, of uh, fish as, as we can. And it's very much an iterative process. So we try to design these assays for target genes. It may or may not work across different species. And so we sometimes have to rethink which genes we're including on these chips. Um, and so it's and that generally means it's a, it's sort of a, a fluid process. But as I said, the, the goal is to uh, produce a full STP chip uh, with 112 uh, qPCR assays on them. And so this uh, compiling the, the, the sequences was a, a ton of work across seven different laboratories. The assays have been designed across uh, four different laboratories. And uh, after it was Again, this is a, a ton of work. Uh, we're at a point now where we've uh, designed a preliminary uh, Salmonid STP chip, and this is largely uh, driven by uh, Shahin. And so he presented some of that stuff yesterday, so you should be familiar with it. So we're actually at a point now where we've got a, a Salmonid specific chip, which should in theory work across as many different species of Salmonids as possible. We've also now designed a second version of a neural gene chip. This was uh, largely uh, led by uh, Shahin and uh, Jen Jeffrey. And we all also completed design of a Salmonid 56 gene thermal and hypoxia stress chip. So these are going to be assays that are sort of representative of a, a Salmonid that's experiencing uh, the thermal stress or hypoxic conditions. And this is largely led by uh, Carol Best and Shahin as well. And of course, the, the genes that we have uh, we have selected for kind of represent a response to a variety of different types of, uh, of stressors that a fish may experience. And we've got our, our four uh, reference genes as well. And so we end up with 108 genes of interest and four reference genes on this complete uh, uh, Salmon and STP chip. And so what we've done now is we've started testing this uh, Salmon and SDP chip. Uh, uh, Shahin had mentioned uh, some of this work yesterday. And so what we've got are, are sort of representative species from four different uh, genera of the Salmonids. And uh, this sort of to represent, you know, as diverse a, a range of species of Salmonids as possible to test the performance of the chip. And so all of those genes are on the single chip. And then so we've got uh, liver, gill, and muscle from each of these eight species that we've now run on the, the Salmonid uh, STP chip. 
And so then we're able to also do some serial dilutions to sort of calculate the the this, this, the what they call the efficiency of the of the assay on the on the different species and the different tissues. And so we can incorporate that into our analyses. <coughs> Excuse me. And so from here, we're able to then test the performance of the Salmon and STP chip across the different t tissues and the different species. And so this will be a really good, uh, this will be really uh, useful in determining how well our approach for designing this chip uh, will work for, across different species. So this will, uh, more information from this will come over the next few months. And so one of the things that have come from this work, from our, our, our attempts at uh, designing this, um, this uh, universal chip is we've we've developed a large database of assays and so from these assays we can then design these more specific sub chips and so as i mentioned we've now have a designed uh, minnow chip uh, there's been a, a circadian rhythm chip that's been designed we've got the thermal stress and hypoxia stress chip and a persiform stress chip and these have all been either ordered or have arrived and they're ready to be tested uh, we've talked about uh, having a Salmon, or sorry, this is actually in the works, sorry, a Salmonid immune response chip. Uh, this is being led from uh, Brian Dixon's lab, and then also an Asipensor uh, stress chip as well. And this is coming from uh, collaborations with Nick Bernier and uh, my lab as well. And so these are in the works, so these will be ordered soon as well. And then in the future, we've talked about having potentially uh, one rel relevant to uh, toxicological responses. Uh, a Salmonid osmoregulation chip, and then also a lamprey stress chip. So we've got a lot of different types of chips that are either have been developed or are in the works and are going to be coming. And so we'll, the future work will be to test the performance of these subchips across different species, and then uh, potentially redesign if necessary or tweak these these chips if we need to. And at that point, we can start uh, running samples from some of the studies associated with Activity 4 that, that Daniel will be talking about uh, shortly. And then we've uh, produced a few, a couple publications that are relevant to some of the work with Activity 3, one of them being this, um, this invited review paper that where we discussed the, the types of tissues that can be non-lethally sampled for transcriptional profiling in fish. And so from this, we've we've talked about the the range of, of tissues that can be non-lethally sampled and used for uh, transcriptional profiling. Uh, sort of some of the limitations that can come from using uh, tissues that are uh, non-lethally sampled versus ones that are, are are lethally sampled, and just how we can use this type of information to kind of figure out. Uh, or interpret some of the physiological responses of wild fishes to changing environmental conditions. And we've also uh, produced now a, a book chapter that talks about some of the applied aspects of gene function for the conservation of fishes. And this, uh, this particular uh, chapter talks about, you know, how gene expression can be estimated because when we're transcriptionally profiling, we're targeting the messenger RNA, which is one aspect in the, the process of how a gene is expressed. We talk a lot about what factors can control gene expression. So we've heard yesterday about the you know, potential issues with um, uh, different levels of, of genome duplication that can also, so the, the genome itself can be really important in terms of how a fish can respond to a stressor. Epigenetic regulation can impact how uh, 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 the transcriptome will respond to certain types of stressors. Uh, what the fish has experienced in the wild prior to being sampling can be important. What the fish has experienced as a juvenile can impact how they respond to a stressor as an adult through the process of developmental plasticity. So there's a lot of different factors that can play into uh, how a, a stress response in the wild is going to elicit a, a transcriptomic response. And this is just things that might help we might need to consider when we're trying to interpret a transcriptome response in wild caught fish. And at this point, I will uh, pass it over to Daniel for activity four updates.
Get to see my bald spot. You know, let's see. <laughs> Thanks, Dennis. On the plus side, at least it wasn't Oliver commenting on my bald spot. Um, yeah, I, I looked at this, and, and this is the volume 39 of Hor and Randall. <laughs> Man, this is the, the book series that doesn't die. <clears throat> Anyways. Okay, so I'm going to talk about activity four, and those of you uh, early career researchers out there should learn something from this. Um, us uh, old, uh, sorry, uh, established researchers sometimes decide, ah, I'll just wing it. And I would plan on that, but I decided to take a quick look and go through my talk and realize there were some very unusual animations embedded in my talk. I personally blame, well, other people, not me. <laughs> Anyways, so the goal of activity four is the validation of the chips that are being produced in activity three. And it consists of three objectives. The first, whoop, the first is the laboratory validation of the STP chips that are produced. So this is not in vitro, this is now in vivo, but it's in live fish under very controlled conditions where we can apply a stressor and have some relatively strong confidence that the stressor we're applying is the only stressor or the major stressor the fish is, is experiencing. Um, so this may be in laboratory tanks or um, really well-controlled raceways. The next is to move away from the controlled environment where we know exactly what's there and there's only the stressors mm -hmm. we're applying and go into more field conditions. And these may be mesocosms where we have introduced a particular stressor, but there may be natural stressors present that we're not aware of. Um, or we can even use a gradient type analysis across a known gradient stressor. And then activity four was what we referred to in the proposal as the proof of concept, real world applications. This is where after we've done the validation, we start um, seeing how it works when we're working with partners. Okay, so the first two uh, um, objectives within activity four really have to do with in vivo validation of the chip. So this is the science uh, and of the of the process where we're doing controlled trials lab based and field trials that are controlled in order to determine whether the genes that we've selected are responding in a way that is consistent and can be interpreted uh, in a in a way that's going to be meaningful for our end users so the in vivo validation consists of the lab trials and the feed field mesocosm gradient trials. What I'm gonna do is give you an idea of where we're at. So the single multiple stressor lab trials, I've split them into two types of projects. If we go first of all to um, this table that shows uh, along the left-hand side, these are the species we've completed trials. There are actually other species that are um, uh, completed, so they're not here, these ones that are ongoing. Um, and the species names in white are ones that were on our original 42 species list that Ken referred to, and the yellow ones are ones where we've opportunistically included some of this validation. And what you can see here is the variety along the top of um, stressors that have been applied across different aspects of activity four. When we originally put this proposal in, we had 42 species by 12 identified stressors. Do the math. We're now being harassed by the ROC. Why isn't this black? And I think we're gonna have an interesting meeting in February, whenever, and we're gonna have to say, okay, get a grip. We're not gonna fill this in. Um, but what we can do is we can look at this. Those of us who are doing these things, we might start saying, let's see if we can fill in some more of these, maybe identify critical stressors that we have to fill in more. Okay, but um, I think this is a good start. And as I said, there are, there are others out there that aren't on here, but not very many. If we go to the multiple stressors, you're seeing essentially the same table. 
But now, because it's multiple stressors, so if we look at uh, brook trout, for example, we've got thermal and angling stress that's being occur uh, applied separately, well, together, but in a way that we can actually tease the two apart to see whether or not they're additive or they're operating in a non-additive way, whether there's some kind of weird synergy. But you can see round goby, there are actually two studies. That's why there's round and uh, red and green. And then if we look at striped bass, there's three um, stressors that are being assessed in, in tandem. The next level is going into the field. So this is where we're relaxing some of our control. This is where we're starting to say, okay, we're going to allow some noise to come in and whether or not when we apply a stressor under these conditions, are we still able to detect the response or is the background noise going to just swamp it? And, you know, there was a question earlier that Shan or yesterday that Shan uh, got was, you know, what about uh, chronic stress? So in the field, in these mesocosms or gradient trials, the fish may have chronic stress that will just blunt their response to any acute stressors that we apply. This gives you an idea of where we're doing on this. This is actually pretty good because this is not an activity, I mean, an objective that we were supposed to be really far ahead of on yet. So uh, a number of researchers or labs have moved forward on this opportunistically again, um, which is giving us a, a jump start. But of course, remember, let me think this is true. I don't think any of these have moved forward to actually STP chip trials. Okay, so uh, activity 4.3, this is proof of concept. I'm going to talk more about this when I get into the examples, but this is not simple to do. And it's really difficult for control freak professors to go to um, end users and say, you tell us what you want to do, and we're just going to do it. And we're going to find out, A, whether it works, and B, whether you're happy with it. So the partner has to select the system, and we may have an incredible temptation to say, well, that's a stupid choice. <laughs> what we're going to do is we're going to do this instead. We have to avoid that. We have to let the partner lead. And then this is a case where the partner may have an idea of what the stressor is, but as the scientist, we may have an idea, well, okay, but we're actually going to throw in a few immune function genes because this stressor might be affecting immune function. And the reason the fish are all dying is not because of you know, the cadmium or whatever it might be they're worried about. It may be that that's shutting down the immune system and they're dying from infection. I'm, I'm making that up, by the way. Um, we're actually way ahead on this. These are ones that actually had some um, planning. There are a number of ones that have been discussed, and I think it's just a matter of people chatting over a beer. These are the uh, projects that have got to the point where there's actual planning involved, where it's driven by interest from specific groups, and we're not like, um, you know, um, Ken's urban pollution in Lake Winnipeg. Is that correct? I suspect you're going to find something that's going to surprise you because <laughs> there's so much going on in Lake Winnipeg. Uh, and uh, in walleye in general. Okay, now I'm going to do some select examples. I'm not going to go into any detail. I'm not giving you all of the projects that's going on. I picked ones that actually have progressed to the point of potentially using either the STP chips developed in GenFish or prototypes that actually inspired the GenFish idea. So open array chips with um, more species specific um, assays. The ones I'm going to be talking about uh, under uh, objective 4.1, because that's the ones we've got further on, uh, was the first I'm going to talk about are two examples of non lethal sampling. This is something that got parachuted into uh, activity four because a lot of our partners, and in fact, some of us, have recognized we don't want to be killing the fish. And it's some of our partners just don't want to have to deal with lethal sampling for a variety of their own reasons. And then some of us are working with fish where it's really difficult to get approval from various um, regulatory agencies to kill fish. And so what we need to do is say, okay, we're gonna kill a few to compare if we do a non-lethal sample and then we do a lethal sample, are they giving us the same information? If it's completely different information, then we are going to be dealing with a separate problem. 
So I'm going to give really quick overview of, of two of the non-lethal sampling projects that are ongoing. Last time I described work in uh, Nick Bernier's lab, uh, and I gather the samples are just waiting to be uh, screened. You're waiting for a chip. <laughs> Maybe not. We'll get to that. Um, and then I'm going to talk one example of controlled single stressor trial. Again, this is uh, application of the brand new uh, uh, Perkid uh, stress chip and then a uh, controlled multiple stressor um, looking at the effect of food additive, in this case probiotic and behavioral considerations as two different types of factors that might affect the, the neural um, transcriptional profile. So these ones first. So this is, and unlike Nick, I actually put the name down. There's Declan and Steve for the, this uh, bloater project. So this, is, this was uh, opportunistic. The bloater are really uh, uh, at-risk species, and they need to know what they're doing in the lakes, so they're tagging them. And they'd also like to be able to take a non-lethal sample and determine the transcriptional health of the fish prior to tagging so that they can interpret their behavior in terms of what shape they're in. This is all leading to, I believe, Declan can change, can, can uh, correct me if I'm wrong, the idea that you'd be able to select the best fish for release for supplementation. So there's the, the surgery taking the non-lethal gill biopsy. There's the array of acoustic um, receivers that are going to be tracking where these fish go. And as Declan mentioned, these uh, fish were uh, underwent surgery as well as the gill biopsy, and there were no mortalities up to the point of release. And now we have the gill tissue, and the plan is to actually do the, the uh, transcriptional profiling here at, um, at Windsor soon. The next, this is a project that Shahin is, uh, is leading under his MyTax postdoc collaboration with uh, Ken and myself. And he's doing this at the, at the Yellow Island Fish Farm. The idea behind this is osmoregulatory stress, which is really relevant to salmon farms in BC because they're getting kicked out of the salt water and they're gonna have to rear their fish in fresh water. And there are questions about whether they're gonna have osmoregulatory stress effects in terms of growth efficiency and survival. Um, so he's doing this on Chinook salmon, partnering with Yellow Island aquaculture. So the fish are freshwater reared 20 gram Chinook salmon. Um, and the idea is he's setting up next week, right, Shahin? Yes. And next week, um, four tanks with fresh water, uh, four tanks with brackish water, and four tanks with full strength seawater. He's going to dump the fish into there, and then he's going to sample all of those replicate tanks at times 0, 12, 24, 48, and 72 hours. So the idea is the ones that are in fresh water, they're not os osmoregulatorily stressed, medium and high, because these guys are at this point reared in fresh water. The non-lethal tissue sample that was proposed and that um, uh, Shane's gonna do is blood, a skin swab, and a gill biopsy. We are not planning to assess whether these non-lethal sampling actually are non-lethal. Uh, that is, we're not going to keep the fish and see how they do, because we're also going to do, I say we, <laughs> uh, what uh, Shahin's going to do is he's going to lethally sample as well. The idea is to compare the transcriptional profile, not to determine whether these um, sublethal um, sampling techniques are actually impacting the fish. And just to make life tough for him, we came up with the idea of also including environmental RNA. <laughs> so he's also going to sample the water that, from the tanks at every one of those points to see whether we could actually determine osmoregulatory stress simply by sampling the water. And then we're going to bump off the fish. I cannot keep saying we. Then Shahin's going to bump off the fish and uh, terminally sample tons of gill tissue and liver to extract RNA, make cDNA. And then the Osma regulatory stress chip that is being planned will be used to assess what is the detectability of that response using the non-lethal versus the lethal samples to see whether they're comparable. And again, Shane, if I got any of this wrong, you 
explain it later. Okay, controlled single stressor trials. There are a lot of these that have been done. The GenFish group has been fantastic at moving forward on this, and I'm well aware that all your um, tissues are stored in RNA later in your various freezers going from BC to, to New Brunswick, and the chips are coming very quickly now, which is really exciting. I think the, the advances in, in activity three is going to make a real game changer over the next six to 12 months. The one I'm going to talk about is acoustic uh, pollution with yellow perch. So this is work that's done by Riley Beach with Dennis Higgs. And in fact, Riley's just writing up to defend in a month or so. And essentially what her project is, is uh, to examine her actual project is designed to look at handling stress and uh, acu acoustic pollution. But I'm just going to be talking about the acoustic pollution. So the idea was they collected yellow perch, they put them in enclosures in the wild, and then they played sound back to them. The specific experimental design is they captured the fish, they uh, put them into those enclosures, they let them acclimate for 30 minutes, they did control where there was no sound for 10 minutes, then they took the control samples, so these are the, the uh, control samples for the analysis of the transcriptional response, and then they played the sound, and it's either white noise or bo boat noise. They then I really like this picture. And I actually did Google STP chip, and that's not what I got. The first thing it came up was actually your um, schematic from your publication. Yeah. Anyways, there it is, the STP chip. The um, Shahin and, and Riley worked together and created a Percoform uh, chip really quickly with 28 uh, elements on it. And uh, not all of the genes worked great, but most of them did. Riley was able to generate a bunch of data. I'm not going to go into the details. I'm just going to give you the punchline to show that it well, sort of worked. So these are the genes that worked along the x-axis. They range from sort of generalized heat shock stress to some immune function genes. These are the, on the y-axis is the mean delta delta CT. So her gene transcription was normalized to endogenous control. That's the delta CT. And the delta delta CT is then uh, normalizing to the mean control gene expression level. So that's why it's all uh, centered on zero, which means it's the same as the control transcriptional um, level. But the interesting thing is there are clear responses to both boat noise and white noise. And in one case, that's HSP70A, I believe. I'm not, I'm not sure I've got it lined up. It looks like the white noise listed a stronger transcriptional response. I actually thought this was pretty cool when Riley uh, um, presented this to her committee. I'm, I'm on her committee because I really didn't expect to see anything in terms of um, stress response to noise, right? I put up with noise all the time. I must be stressed. Okay, uh, so last one for objective 4.1 is controlled multiple stressor trials. This is work done by Chelsea Frank, a, a graduate student. I think she's, there she is. Hi, Chelsea, wave. Um, she's also in the process of writing up this data. She is primarily supervised by Tina Semenyak, and I was her co-supervisor. And the idea that the actual experiment or project is much more complex, I'm giving you a narrow view of what was going on. But essentially, she was looking at food additive, in this case, probiotic, but also looking at behavioral aspects of the same fish, and then looking using the brain chip version zero. Because <laughs> this was a brain chip that was developed as a, a previous or a prototype prior to the gen fish. Some of the same genes, many of the same genes were on there. So she was using um, uh, Chinook salmon at the small stage, she, the fish were fed either just regular feed or probiotic additive feed, additive feed, and they were held at barrels at the Yellow Island Aquaculture Facility, where um, Chelsea assessed a bunch of behavioral and other variables about fish, but also ran the STP chip, or in this case, the Chinook uh, salmon stress chip. And, okay, I'd like to digress, sorry, it's, it's me. So there we have the chip. 
Here we have actual data from Chelsea. Nick, zoom in. 40 cycles. There's something really weird going on with our open array system. Because we were told the maximum number of cycles the data will, uh, will acquire data is 32 cycles. We've gotten a big fight with uh, Thermal Fisher about this. And yet, I went back, and not only Chelsea, but other students have actually got raw data up to 40. So we have to explore this. this you probably don't care, but it's, this, this is really important. Anyways, that's her raw data for one of her genes. And this is a heat map that is quite different from what you normally get from transcriptional profiling. And I think it's very cool. So you're not looking at gene transcriptional levels. But what you're looking at is for each of these genes identified as a main um, function, that is the p-value corrected um, for all of the various um, the independent variables and their interactions. What I'm talking about right now is feed. And in fact, only one gene came up as being significantly correlated or affected by the feed treatment, which I, <laughs> I suspect you were a little disappointed with, Chelsea. But one of the things that I found fascinating about this data that Chelsea provided was this feed by activity interaction. Now we're starting to see, first of all, the same gene shows up, but two more come in as being significant. This highlights the real importance of the multiple stressor trials, because this is not additive, in my opinion. What we're starting to see is synergetic responses. So the multiple stressors, which is what we're going to be running into when we're trying to solve OMNRF's problems in, let's say, um, Lake St. Clair, it's not going to be a single stressor. OK, this is going out of the lab and going into a more natural system, a mesocosm. And I'm not going to talk about the natural system trials. They are ongoing, and samples have been collected, but there's no data. So the one that we do have data were, was a preliminary study on Chinook salmon um, immune challenge. And what they do is they grow the salmon in semi-natural um, streams, and you see them there. So again, this is not like in the hatchery where they control everything. This is where they actually have predators. That's you know why the thing over the top. They have variation in temperature. They have variation in um, uh, social interactions amongst the fish. This is a project that was done some years ago by Shelby McKay, co-supervised by Brian Dixon, and he, she was working in my lab. This was. Um, an attempt to see what would happen if there was an intense or acute immune challenge to the fish in these semi-natural raceways. So the fish were injected with a live pathogen, and then they were sampled, um, I believe it was 48 hours later. May have been longer. Um, and again, another way to present the transcriptional profile, but essentially what we have are the candidate genes along the x-axis, and the full change relative to the control or sham injected fish. And again, the take home from this, you know, whether or not a particular um, gene responded, in this case, for example, uh, NKEF had strong down regulation, but rather the pattern. And the other thing is that some of the genes that responded had no direct immune function that we know of. Um, and then others were very clearly, some of the interleukins were clearly associated with the immune response to the, to the challenge. But the point is, this really highlighted to me the importance of going back to the partners and being able to say, well, you know, we're not really worried about CYP1A, but the pattern of response across all of these genes. Okay, the last thing I'm going to finish up soon is um, proof of concept, the partner-led projects. As I said, this is not straightforward. First of all, you have to collaborate with the end users to identify the candidate systems. You have to avoid the temptation to lead. Because if you do, many end users will say, oh yeah, well, you're the expert. You tell me. 
But then at the end, they don't feel it's their, they were driving it. And that will defeat the purpose of this particular um, uh, objective for activity four. Whoop. Um, don't just go in and sample the fish. Again, you, there's a temptation. I know how to sample fish. You've got to do it within two minutes. You've got to get that tissue into the RNA later or into the, the dry shipper really quickly. No, because when they're doing it on their own, they're not going to have you sitting beside them. So you've got to collaborate with them, train them if, if uh, they want to be trained, and let them sample the fish with any assistant you can provide. Then you take the samples and you can leave them behind. If they want to be involved with the lab stuff, fantastic. Generally speaking, my experience is they want it to be a black box. So you apply the STP chip, and this is the one. They interactively develop the interpretation. And one of our deliverables for GenFish is actually to come up with software, we were just discussing this, that's going to take the output from the open array um, uh, STP chip or nanofluidic uh, qPCR assay and go from all that raw data, such as what I showed from Chelsea's project, and have it come up with something that is, first of all, um, intuitive, and second of all, attractive, that allows people to look at it and say, oh, that's not good, all the immune genes are firing. Or even worse, all the immune genes are down-regulated. Whatever's going on, their immune genes are not being expressed. So this is something we, that is a challenge for us in activity four that has to happen sooner rather than later. I think that's, oh yes, this is the example. This is one I may have already shared. I think that was with the ROC. So this is work that um, Ken, uh, Ken Jeffries, Arfa, and, and Jen Jeffrey uh, did. Have I missed anybody on this one? This is the whitefish. Uh, they're eDNA people. <laughs> anyway, sorry. I'm dissing people already. Anyway, so the proof of concept here was um, it was a collaboration primarily with Athabasca, Chippewa, First Nation, um, and the AFCN community-based monitoring program. I think the primary interest was using eDNA to see what was there, but uh, opportunistically also examined questions about contamination and food fish. So they knew the contaminants were a problem in some of their water bodies, um, and specifically they were interested in what was, the, what was the effect on northern pike walleye in Lake Whitefish. And I believe all these tissues, maybe cDNA, are in the freezer, waiting for, wait for it, STP chips. Uh, but, but Ken and his lab didn't wait for that. They actually moved forward and they did individual qPCRs. This is for um, CYP1A, liver tissue from the whitefish that were collected in one of the sites. And you know, there's mRNA abundance. I'm not gonna go into details about this except a couple of points I wanna make is these are individual fish that are experiencing the same environment. Look at the variation in the expression of the, this detoxi detoxification gene. This to me highlights that perhaps variable exposure due to behavioral differences. Some of them are just using different parts of the environment and getting exposed to the contaminant at lower levels, or it may be genetic, maybe the ones that aren't expressing this are just genetically programmed to downregulate CYP1A. You get the idea. But this is highlighting to me that it's not simply the whitefish are in a tank and we're dumping in contaminants. This is not a single stressor. And I think getting to the point of doing the full gene transcriptional profiling, not only on the whitefish, but the walleye and pike too, is gonna to be really cool. This is gonna address questions that are of real concern to the First Nation partners, as well as Parks Canada. So there's the chip waiting. I love this picture. <laughs> See the fish shaking her head. Okay, that's it. So there's questions on either activity. So Ken, you need to get up here too. Uh, Scott. Sorry if I asked this in 2019, I just don't remember. But uh, in the proof of cons, in, the, in the, the last bit that you talked about, where it's actual application. Proof of concept, yeah. OK. Do, do you, don't you 
always need a reference site for those. I'm just, I'm a little, you know, there, there's a lot of variability in nature that we don't know about. A lot of genes have many different effects. We don't necessarily know what they are. It seems like, to me, you need a reference, some kind of a reference where you know you already think the stress is not, rather than just looking at absolute terms Okay. Uh, uh, the treatment. Scott, I'm going to answer this from my point of view, which is unconventional. And I think both Ken and Nick are going to be twitching a bit. <laughs> and my answer is, you're thinking like a scientist. You're thinking like somebody who wants to publish this. The intent of all of activity three and activity four, objective one and two, is to say, if a fish is immune challenged under all of these different conditions, this is what they're going to do to these genes, and this is what it's going to do to those genes. And one gene may be like, CYP1A may do weird stuff, but when you look at it as a whole, as a profile, the general profile of immune challenge is going to be this. And you don't have to have reference. You can go into a single population and say, okay, these genes are firing, these aren't. Pattern-wise, we think it's X. It's not going to be definitive. But on the other hand, it's going to say, okay, we think what's going on is that there is contaminant stress. If you see what I mean. If we say, okay, you have to have reference, you have to have replicates, we're right back to doing science, and it's not a tool that can be used by end users. Would you like to counteract? I, 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 no, I agree. Um, <laughs> so this was part of a, a pilot study, and it was you know, largely eDNA uh, focused, but we also wanted to see if this approach would work, the idea that we could get a, a remote community to sample the fish as part of their, their typical monitoring program and see if we can you know, get the samples back and be able to actually do an transcriptional profile. The original plan was to have multiple sites, but you know, if we're relying on a, a community-based monitoring program, we, you know, we have to opportunistically get the samples that we get, and if they don't, sample at the different sites then that's just it's what happened that year but it, it was a really informative process and at least we know that we can do it even even though the the samples that were overnight shipped to u of m from northern alberta arrived a week later and completely thought that's the beauty of rna later they still ended up working out so we used we learned a lot from that process and if, if, if this were to continue we'd be able to you know address some of those that those other aspects i just wanted to layer on your last point daniel uh, when we did that project a lot of those stomachs were empty so there was a lot of variation just even in what they had to eat and that was one of the things that the indigenous partners were interested in is why are some of these white fish coming back more stunted than usual and it looked like well maybe there's not as much food or maybe they're just behavior they're not feeding so you know i think there's an opportunity to layer some of that kind of data on that individual expression too mm -hmm. yeah. tina just add to that about there's appetite genes metabolism genes that you see in specifically terms of the show potentially starvation if you've got if there's a suspected um predator ais coming through or a competitive ais coming through Mm -hmm. You could potentially pick that up, so you respond on. Oh, you have to run another G uh, chip now. The growth metabolism chip. Actually, I like that idea. Nick. So just to clarify, the data you showed was the open rate from one of your students. That went to 40, 40 cycles. cycles. Chelsea, that was on the open array, right? Yeah. yeah. That was on the Thermal Fisher open array so machine. How Chelsea managed to, to get 40? Well, I, I sent her an email last night and I said, did you take a pen and like extend all of those? And she said, no, 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 that's the raw data. So this, this is a, an issue where, that came up about the equipment, the platform we've used for transcriptional profiling appears to limit the number of cycles it will go to. So if you're in fish and you have a really low expressed gene, it may not be able to detect it. 
because it's biased towards, what did you call it, rodent-centric? I love that. So it may not be ideal, and we're getting ready to fight with Thermo Fisher to say you've got to change the software to go to 40 cycles. But then I was looking at Chelsea's, and it, the raw data, anyways, appears to be collected up to 40 cycles. Yep. Uh, is there a problem with simplifying the answer too much? Okay, I think that that is a really good point. Um, that, in fact, it may be that we cannot give a simple answer. And make it. I'd like to make it clear that in our proposal, we, we said that was a risk. We had to put the risk section in there. It may not be possible to use a transcriptional profile, even over 108 genes, to unambiguously say it's contaminant stress, it is uh, social stress or, or immune challenge. Um, I'm still hopeful, but the problem is we have problems with end users understanding eDNA capability. Um, if we don't make this simple, the end users aren't going to be interested in transcriptional. It's, it, they'll say, to heck, I was going to say them back. To heck with that. I'll just take the fish and I'll do a um, um, necropsy on it and, and determine what, why they're sick or not. And that's sort of avoiding the potential uptake of the, the equipment, of the uh, facility or approach. That's a good, good question, uh, Mark. Yes, Scott? Uh, can you run back to the slide with uh, the, 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 the infections when you injected into the fish that had a bunch of negative, like, uh, yeah, okay. So a lot of the significant ones there are super small fold changes. Yeah, that's why fold change is useless. Fold changes, it, again, I'm going out on LinkedIn. I'm going to have Ken say, I don't know this guy. Fold change came from biomedical researchers where they said anything over two is meaningful because they don't know how to do stats. But in fact, if, if your transcriptional response has very little variance, yeah. then a very small fold change can still be significant. Yeah. So that's why some of these are tiny. Yeah. I mean, I agree with you. Uh, and two is way, way too high of a threshold. But it looks like you might have 0 0.05 there. And I mean, I could, I could think of drawing some other threshold that's way lower than two that would, uh, you know. And we're going to get there. I, I think that the reality is if we're looking at 0.05 fold change, that may be so subtle that we won't be able to reliably detect it with background noise. Although this was taken in the in the natural semi-natural streams, and we still the transcriptional response had small enough variability that we were able to detect significant effects with relatively big little change. Nick, you had a question. I did, and it was a, a, a comment on on Mark's question. I think that as a whole within activity four, we, we have to think when we get closer to the end of this that uh, it, that uh, the, how the chips are going to be used has to come with a set of recommendations. And, and, and so if you're interested in, in, in this, these particular stressors, maybe when you go to sample, think of collecting these types of tissues. <laughs> you know, because it, it's not going to we want to, the, the, the problem with oversimplification is to make people believe that you can take any tissue and measure any, any kind of response. And, and where we, we know that's certainly not the case based on their experience. But if we come up with a simple set of, of guidelines, then that will you know, prevent the tool, the, the end users from saying, oh, this is useless. But it's useless because you didn't know these simple guidelines you you know, it's a really good point to, to sort of overpromise and underdeliver. You got to be really careful. I agree, and I really like the idea of, of like a maybe even a pictogram, um, sort of like what uh, uh, Matthew Yates has done for eDNA sampling. You know, he's got the 20-page detailed one, but then he narrowed it down to like one page. Of, this is what you need to do, and I, I agree. That's a really good idea. Yeah, Tina. Some gaps in translation. 
of the information that whoever's going to be running the chips has to do that we have to be, we have to collectively decide on. It. You're right, one of the sampling mechanisms to get to your answer. And then when the answer comes in, we have to color code. This is only 0.05 volt change, so we're going to color code that green. Right? And so, and that's what that means. It's going to take a lot of input to decide on best practices going forward once we have the information in hand. So once everything comes out from activity three and four, that collected data, then we need to parse it. We need to know how we package it. Yeah. So very good question. I saw Steve pop up. Do you have a question, Steve? Or did you just turn on your camera? No, sorry, I just joined. Okay. <laughs> if I may, uh, we'll have more time to talk about it after lunch. It's uh, 10.53 at the moment. If mm -hmm. you want to take a five minute file break before we come back. back to Perfect. <laughs> okay, thanks everybody. We'll get started now. So for those of you who don't know me from yesterday or my constant piping up, I'm Tina Semenyuk. I'm an associate professor here at the University of Windsor. I had the privilege of working with the team, with Daniel, Margaret, with Nick, and with Steve on putting this proposal together. Um, and for my sins, I'm the activity lead for activity five. I just want to explain to you what that is. Do so you see there are basically two icons in the corner there, Ontario Genomics and Genome Canada. This isn't just a grant for us researchers and in HQP, we're researchers, all of us, to just do what we like to do, do a little bit of research. Um, this has to be commercialized. We need to show products. And so what you haven't really heard explicitly, but it's kind of been implicit through all of this, is that we're trying to create a product for uptake by which we call the end user, but really it's just resource sector users. Whether they're from government, whether or not they're from communities, whether or not they're from ENGOs, environmental consultants and in industry. And so we have proposed to deliver two types of toolkits. One is the fish survey toolkit. So that is a list of or, or types of assays that are known to work with our freshwater fish, um, fishes across our water bodies. And so it's our assay designs that we're hoping for uptake. So we're not, it's not that we want people to uptake eDNA. It's, it's that, yes, but in conjunction with our products. And it's not that we just want people to, to survey the health of our Canadian fishes, freshwater fishes, but to also use the STP chip that's under development. And you've already heard comments from all of you saying, and even from Amy yesterday saying, okay, well, are there any um, barriers? Uh, how are they gonna believe the data coming out? What's gonna make them do it properly? And so that's where activity five comes in because we've promised our own toolkit as well. So essentially, we're proposing to create this decision-making toolkit where we're going to be presenting all this information collected throughout activities one through four and in consultation with our users to assess the utility of these genomic toolkits. Is it something that can fulfill a need that's required? And if it is, it's great, but are there any barriers to potential adoption? So for example, if we were to do a toolkit and we, we bring it to a resource sector user, they're going to be looking at making a decision. And what's involved in this decision is the fact, well, are there any ethical implications involved in this, right? We've been hearing about this. Will it be accepted by the general public? Um, what about the efficiency? There's person power efficiency, there's infrastructure efficiency, and to weigh that all against the conventional methods that are currently being applied assessing any of the risks to using this. There is this question about, you know, 0.05 fold change. There's a question about non-lethal sampling. What would be the outcomes of it? We don't have a reference site, but that's all what the end user is going to be communicating to us that could be potential barriers. And at the end of the day, then, as they adjust their levers to say, okay, is this acceptable or not? Is this risk acceptable? Is the cost acceptable? At the end of the day, yes, this does make sense for us to adopt it, given the package that we're receiving. So this is our toolkit, and that is our deliverable for Activity 5. So Activity 5 is called GELS and as an acronym. So that stands for the genomic as well as the ethical, environmental, economic, those are the three E's, the legal and the social implications of using genomics. 
And so we have a little bit more of an intimate group for activity five, and we have three objectives. The first one is led by Dr. Amy Fitzgerald from social sciences here at the University of Windsor. You've all met her yesterday, and she's looking into the emerging ethical concerns that can act to potentially block the use of genomics. Amy uses a, an array of techniques and tools under her belt, such as literature reviews, focus groups, which we were a part of yesterday, as well as um, media sweeps. So what I, just like what Daniel did, I'm going to just pick and choose and highlight some of the research that our Activity 5 leads have been doing. So for example, um, today we know that the media not just reflects what's happening in our society, but it can sometimes, I, I think, take control of it and could uh, set an agenda in terms of what it wants to present. So this is what Amy was looking into. So she looked at two main um, newspapers, one in the United States, that's the New York Times, one here in Canada, that's Globe and Mail. And she looked to see from the years 2000 uh, to 2020, she did this in conjunction with Jen Halliday, who you met yesterday as well, her PhD student, as well as Daniel. She looked at the number of instances social and ethical considerations were mentioned in these two newspapers over time. And some of the um, categories in which it was mentioned include here, let's say, conservation, metagenomics, um, mitigation, and you see that there's this, this, this bump between 2009 and 2011, and that actually corresponded to an incidence of aquatic invasive species. So there were some instances when reliability and validation was mentioned with eDNA, but it happened in reference to the legal and a legal case involving an aquatic invasive species. So that's how it was mentioned. So social and ethical implications weren't raised by the media, weren't reflected in the media. Um, if it did, it was always related to financial implications, if it impinged upon business interests or kind of project development. So that was uh, published, and Amy is now with Jen. Uh, they worked on doing another media sweep, but this time using the keyword of transcriptomics, right? Because it's not just eDNA that's GenFish. GenFish is also eDNA surveying, but also health. Um, she's waiting on the response and the edits back by one of her co-authors, and that person holding it up is me. So the next AGM will be sure to uh, give you how it's, it's actually quite different, and it's really interesting in how it's different in terms of how they've all both been portrayed in the media. So Amy did a focus group with us yesterday, and she's also continuing her focus groups. I put her email address here down below, because one thing we really want to do is to reach out to other groups that weren't represented here yesterday, um, one of which are, in, are Indigenous uh, scholars that we're working with. So some of us already have really good relationships with Indigenous scholars, they're partners on GenFish, and these are some of the voices that we really want to hear from. And so um, please reach out to Amy. Amy may be reaching out to you as well to be able to um, ensure that her focus group is as complete as we can possibly make it. Uh, the next objective is led by Dr. Tongji Li from the University of Guelph. Again, we met Tongji yesterday with her behavioral um, and economics games. Tongji is focused on the economic and regulatory factors that impact the social acceptance as well as the adoption. So again, looking at these barriers to adoption. As a behavioral economist, her and her group use instruments, and you saw some of that yesterday, um, just basically instruments that could nudge people's decision making. The rate of adoption, not just the rate of adoption of novel technology, but also the rate of diffusion. So how quickly does it spread and to whom does it spread? So just to give you an example of some of the work that Amy did with um, Connor Smith, a former master's student who is now working, I think, at DFO, if I'm not mistaken. He was actually on the call yesterday, he might be on the call today. But um, Tong Jin and her group, they, they basically conducted a contingent valuation survey. In other words, a willingness to pay. And they targeted almost 1,000 recreational anglers across Canada. And the question simply was, and I am simplifying it, Tong Jin, I apologize. It was like, how much would you be willing to pay to fish on your preferred watershed, knowing that it's being managed using eDNA technology? Are you going to give a positive willingness to pay or a negative willingness to pay or neutral? And it turned out to be almost universal. It's quite surprising that 
up to 33% of the premium that they'd be willing to pay in addition to what they were, they're already paying to go fishing um, on the watersheds that adopt these eDNA technologies. They have a really strong preference for this, regardless of how much they know about eDNA. So the information that's being provided, because there were surveys that gave information about eDNA technology and those that didn't, and there wasn't a significant difference between the two. That's because we're talking about how much knowledge do our, our end users or our recreational or resource sectors users know already, but they feel somewhat knowledgeable already about eDNA technology. I think it's a lot more in the people who are really invested in fishes as well as their conservation. And they do believe it will improve management. So with Tongji's work, it's also looking to see, okay, it's not just economic nudges to influence adoption, but it also has implications for policy design. And so this increase in social welfare that we're picking up from these recreational anglers can be used by fisheries managers as a kind of tool in management policy saying, okay, we do have this willingness, it's positive, they're willing to pay, that could be used as a lever in terms of increasing acceptability amongst potentially some stakeholders that might not be as you know a little bit hesitant. So yesterday we did an, a, a behavioral economics experiment. Here's Tong Ji's email address. If you have any more information, she might be reaching out to you as well. And I think the next steps for Tong Ji and her group are to look at fisheries managers, and this is really interesting, early adopters. So you do have people who can meet early adopters of a novel technology and you know what happens if we subsidize can we subsidize to create early adopters can we subsidize or use these economic instruments to then amongst the early adopters get that acceptance to diffuse so there's this diffusion rate too that's associated with it so i'm really looking forward to those i think it's a really cool study coming up Last on our objective, and not least, and potentially the, the weightiest of the objectives, and poor John there, I can see beads of sweat, and it's this ex ante evaluation of innovative technologies. In other words, it's, it's forward looking to see can we help to predict and help those to decide whether or not this technology is fit for their mandate, um, you know, part of their system, part of their ethos. And so this is led by Dr. Lee Renoir from the University of Guelph, who's also an economist. And part of this objective is also to create this toolkit at the end. So that really does involve working with everybody. And that's what John has been doing already. He's been working with activity leads from activity one through four, but not just activity leads, but he's gone out and he's spoken to our users as well. And he's starting to do putting together information to conduct a cost benefit analysis. So what John is looking at is alternatives that can provide a maximum benefit from the intended investment. And so are you getting a return on investment for this? And so he started already. John's work really does kick in a little bit later on in the grant because, again, we, we still need to have all this information coming from all of our other activities. And so this is what we're waiting on right now, just to basically look at conventional methods. So we've got gill netting. We've been talking about electrofishing. We have people out here already doing those on-the-ground work as well, some of the students, and compare that against you know, eDNA uh, water sampling. We've already been hearing how you could do it in a day versus a week. So again, that all comes back into that cost efficiency or person power. And then for the health side of things, a necropsy, maybe doing some uh, a stress panel on them, a blood panel versus an SDP chip. And here I deliberately did not choose Daniel as our model. That's not even a chip. Nothing looks like that, but I'm stubborn and I refuse to use Daniel again. Um, so again, it's really exciting, and John's going to probably be reaching out. I see John talking to people already here, and so this is I'm really, really glad for this AGM so we can make these connections and know that um, we're kind of intertwined. Nick even put up a paper where I think um, Amy and John were co-authors on eDNA and sampling, so you can see how it's really being interconnected. I know we always, sometimes we like to think that they're two silos, the natural and the social sciences, but this is really an integrated effort and just to encourage that to keep going. Um, we don't just do that, and, and again, this gel section is not just um, I'm looking at the specifics, but what's really important to, a, to us as GenFish is to look at co-production. You've heard Nick say, you've heard all of our, and what Daniel showed today, that this, our work with our end users, they're not our end users, they're our beginning users. It started way before we ever put in this application for GenFish. Um, we've been working with it, uh, our partners for so long that it was really a collaborative effort in terms of, of getting us, getting our butts in gear to write this grant together. And so some of that you can see is evidence in some of the work that we've done um, prior and since. And so here's a paper led by Steve Cook 
on revisiting the Peirce Report that came out in 1988 by Peter Peirce in terms of policy development, where are we now? And the co-authors are our PIs on GenFish as well as our partners on GenFish, including them. And uh, one of the take home messages, so for those of you who don't know, Peter Peirce um, had the seminal paper that came out talking about um, uh, policy development of natural resources in Canada, as well as, let's say, transfer quotas, all that kind of public goods. And reviewing that, the co-authors basically said, we need to use novel technology. And eDNA is part of this novel technology. And to be able to manage our fishery stocks, to be able to assess them properly, as well as to manage them, with the caveat that we need to do it with our stakeholders and with our knowledge holders in a very meaningful and respectful way. Again, that goes through our ethos of co-production, co-development, co-engagement. And this was a study that was done with eDNA as the focus. In terms of using the STP chip as a focus, I led a paper again with our, um, some of our PIs on the ground as well as our partners and exclusively where we did a case study. So we talked to people who were part of industry, um, some of our partners, they contributed. So they're all co-authors. Um, we had our co-authors that came from environmental NGOs, some environmental consultancies we had from uh, the governments, as well as fisheries commissions. And of course, we also had an indigenous representation, a member of an indigenous community to also comment on it. Um, this was a photo, the picture that Daniel was referring to when he Googles an STP chip because we felt that was a really, really important figure to include in our paper to give an understanding of what the process looks like and what an STP chip even is. So one of the barriers, the, one of the first barriers we came when we were reaching out to our partners was what does it mean a chip? Some of us thought they were like pit tag chips that you would insert like on a cat and a dog, right? Or a pit tags, so that's a chip, and we could potentially read it that way. So there was still this basic understanding. So you could see how um, our, the awareness of it is not yet at the same level as with eDNA. So there are some, just, some barriers of just knowledge of what it does. But looking at it and having these discussions of what it is and what it can do, um, everyone was on board about the power of using this kind of um, health as not only a diagnostic tool to say, okay, why are our fish dying, but almost as a prognostic tool to say, okay, what do we have to be aware of that, you know, we didn't think. So if you were to do this SDP chip and you don't just have contaminant genes lighting up, but you have starvation genes lighting up as well. It tells you, okay, maybe there's some, another alert. That's why we have so many different types of genes on these STP chips. But there were some take-home messages. And you can see my bias in describing this the most because it's the one I'm most familiar with. And that is um, all of the rights holders, knowledge holders, and stakeholders felt that there has to be this kind of reliability. It has to be reliability that it can be equally applied in different parts, different water bodies, as well as over time. So it has to be consistent. So the results we're getting has to be consistent. We don't want too much variability. We have to have a return on our investment. So there goes the, those cost benefit analyses again. What they're putting in, um, they might do it in conjunction. Does, should one replace the other technique? Again, it's not just financial, but infrastructure. I, we did feel, and what we heard back was that if one resource use sector picks up this as a tool and then uses it, let's say for a legally defensible position, well, it has to be recognized by other jurisdictions. And so if they're presenting one set of evidence that's then not going to be acknowledged by another resource use sector because one might not believe in the validity of an SDP chip, then why should they? So there has to be a general acceptance because when we're talking about fish health, we might be talking about triggering some, um, let's say, environmental restrictions, some laws that might come into effect, some um, shutting down development. Because again, some of our environmental consultants were working with road development and doing EIAs, so environmental impact assessments. Big data. Who has the data? Who is going to be analyzing the data? If they do, they just get the report, or do they get all the sequence reads behind it and all of um, all that raw data? And if that's the point, um, who's going to store it? Who's going to archive it? Who's allowed to access these data? Again, there's that access accessibility issue that was raised. And last of all, if we want to actually make this happen, there is a steep learning curve. We have to, to integrate all of this into training. But who's going to do the training? Uh, who's going to put in the infrastructure? And when we're dealing with potentially um, First Nations groups, there is best practices that we need to follow. That was one of the biggest things. Some of us already have relationships, but if let's say 
Um, we're starting to start off new relationships with First Nations communities because we want to explore a new water body. Um, we do have to go through making sure that we follow and do this morally, legally, respectfully, and meaningfully with co-engagement always and co-production always in the front of our mind. So with that, I know you'll probably have a lot of questions, which I'm happy to answer after Steve gives a talk next, but we do have this decision guiding toolkit, the gels we like to call it at 2.30 to 3 o'clock in room 250, which is this room, I think. Yeah, so right back here um, for more questions and a lot of more dialogue. And I'm really fortunate that all of my um, activity PIs are here, unlike Daniel and, and Nick and Margaret. Um, I think Ken does his own. I think Ken is the only SDP chip person or, or Shahin. Um, but so you can ask them these questions directly and they won't have to be filtered through me. Thanks very much, everybody. It's not lunch. It's not lunch. No, Steve's giving a talk now. Morning, folks. Anybody hear me? Can you hear me well? <laughs> Excellent. Excellent. And I presume you can see my presentation. Good. OK, let's do this. So uh, thanks, Tina. That was a great overview. Um, I'm one of the people that's sort of lurking in the background when it comes to activity five. Yesterday, you saw uh, Andrew Howarth um, uh, deliver a presentation. Uh, Vivian Nguyen and I at Carleton are both sort of working on filling in any of the sort of the spaces in between or things on the margin uh, that are needed to help apply the work and the knowledge that's coming out of activities one through four. And so they don't necessarily fit into any of the, the three specific objectives, but they they fit broadly into connecting the science with practice and application. And so what I'm going to talk about today is, is rethinking how we manage inland freshwater fisheries, uh, how we might want to modernize that. And I'm going to do so through a presentation called Dynamic Fisheries Management for a Dynamic World. And I do have some other co-conspirators. I'll introduce them at the very end. Okay. All right. So let's take a second and look at the word dynamic. So it's an adjective. Uh, it's about either a process or a system that's characterized by constant change, activity, or progress. And in many ways, that's really a, um, a good descriptor of the freshwater uh, uh, systems where all of us work. And we have different components that are, are changing uh, the system, the ecosystem itself in terms of the biota with invasive species and disease and climate change and so on. We also have change in the, the institutional systems that, that govern uh, how we interact with these resources. And then there's the behavior of the resource users themselves. So all of these things are, are very dynamic. Um, dynamic also means uh, a person with a positive attitude and full of energy and new ideas. And I hope I deliver on that as well today. So uh, a dynamic world. So here we have invasive species. This is a goldfish from Hamilton Harbor. We've got various uh, infrastructure projects, including dam development that leads to fragmentation. Uh, we've got various pharmaceutical products that are ending up in our water bodies and organisms. We have aggregate mining. Uh, this happens to be a sand and gravel mining from our, our rivers. Uh, we have pathogens, viruses, bacteria, and so on that, that make uh life challenging and some of these i should i should be clear are, are very normal but when we push fish to the edge or move organisms around or by or uh, pathogens around things can go poorly we have people that use our our resources so this is a, an ice fishing pick uh and so we can have exploitation or in this case perhaps over exploitation uh, we have climate change, and I've used sort of the, a classic uh, picture here uh, that sort of gives the impression that climate change means hot and dry, but cl climate change can mean many other things, including cold shock and flooding and so on. Uh, and so all of that brings us to what we 
now uh, generally uh, accept as the the Anthropocene. We're in a, a period that's distinct from the the Holocene, and it's characterized by the impact that we have had on uh, our planet. Uh, really, quite a um, a manifold uh, impact. And so we've got all these multiple threats that intersect in various ways, in complex ways. Uh, ecosystems and their constituent fish assemblages and populations are are changing. Uh, the um, UN, sorry, not the UN, uh, the WWF Living Planet Index uh, from this most recent year, uh, fish pop, uh, aquatic freshwater populations are down on average 87% relative to 1970 numbers. We know that change can be rapid and is often unpredictable, and that really makes it tough for, for managers. Yet most of our management approaches are reactive, and sometimes those interventions become too uh, come too late and aren't effective at maintaining biodiversity or achieving management objectives. So I would argue that what we're doing today uh, is is we're not doing as well as we could be doing. And so I submit that it's time to rethink fisheries management and use new tools and technology to our advantage. And so I want to introduce you to fisheries management for the future. So you can imagine a fisheries manager sitting at their desk or in the field would be even nicer with a tablet. Uh, and this is what they would see, something like this. Now, this is my pathetic uh, uh, sort of GIF uh, <laughs> um, clip art creation here. But you can imagine that on one side, you've got real-time data feeds coming in from all sorts of things. So we'll pretend this is something to do with walleye. And so you've got uh, various drone footage of what fish are doing and what uh, humans are doing on the landscape. You've got angler collected data coming in from smartphone apps. You've got eDNA and fish health data that's coming in from programs like GenFish. Uh, information on the environment, where animals are in space and time. So you've got all these data feeds coming in. Then you've got a data aggregator and management action. And so what I want to do is just walk through how something like this could actually work. So let's start with these real-time data feeds. So eDNA, very obvious one. Everybody in the room knows what we're talking here. We can document community structure, detect invasive species, and assess trends in population, and even size and biomass. That's what we're, we're working towards. Of course, the, the omics side of things, we can assess fish health and condition, identify stressors, diagnose pathogens and disease. We have electronic tagging and tracking tools to assess natural and fishing mortality, look at where animals are distributed in space and time, including uh, revealing critical habitats that need to be protected. We can use drones, both aerial and aquatic, to look at the habitat, visualize the fish and fisher distribution, and to collect water quality data. We can do eye ecology. So this is mining online resources to look at changes in fisher behavior. So when people go fishing and they post to Facebook or they post to Twitter, you can actually mine that information to get an idea of, of, of uh, trends and patterns, what people are talking about and what they're doing. Uh, and this can provide a, a source of human dimensions data. We have smartphones apps, which are uh, very common. Uh, many anglers download these uh, because they serve as a source of information for the angler, but a way to all, for that angler to also give information back. And uh, many of the apps are interfaced already with government agencies so that when you make a report, it ends up in a database that can be later accessed. And there's some great work being done in that space to assess fish community structure, look at the spatial temporal distribution of fishers, and you can even query fishers about management options. You can ping things out to them and say, hey, you know, walleye anglers, what do you think about this option for this water body? What would you do or how would you react if we made this change? So we've got all these real-time or near real-time data feeds coming in. Now, the challenge has historically been that, uh, you know, many grad students in the room, uh, you download uh, a big telemetry data set, or uh, you, you now have your, your omic samples and you've run them, and then you stare at them and battle with R for months and months and months, and months might turn into years. And uh, all of a sudden it's three years later before there's a peer reviewed paper that a manager sees 
yet they haven't been able to use that information in real time. So are there ways to create these data aggregators and, and provide uh, folks with what they need in a more real time basis? And I would argue that we're at a point in time where that's very possible, thanks to our friends uh, that work in the, the data science realm. Uh, this is where we can uh, integrate and process data streams, identify patterns and provide rapid syntheses of data in formats that are usable to managers. And I don't claim this is my expertise. Uh, Sapna and Pedro certainly have more expertise in, in this space, uh, but we're getting better and better at being able to assess and synthesize big uh, amounts of data in, in short order. Uh, and that could be of great use to managers. And then finally, having all of that link into management action. So uh, again, working with their dashboard, they could have a, a toolbox, a suite of options that allow them to bring in these diverse uh, data streams, including historical data, conventional data that we, we also will want to continue to collect. And this idea that the evidence base is living and will evolve and that it spans knowledges and could even bring in uh, other ways of knowing, including indigenous knowledge. And there's already opportunities to bring in uh, Fisher knowledge uh, through some of the apps that I've already uh, talked about. And then the other thing is to instantly communicate management actions or changes to resource users, the enforcement staff, frontline practitioners and and so on. And so you can, as I mentioned, you could use apps to push information uh, out uh, to let people know, but also to query them and make it more about feedback on on uh, perspectives on different uh, management actions and options. And I know this might seem to most of us working in the Great Lakes Basin as as not the normal way of doing things. We're used to going to the regulation book, which changes once a year, that tells us about where we can fish for which species and how many we can catch and so on. Uh, when I lived in British Columbia, uh, almost two decades ago, DFO did this, where you had to phone in each day to see what the fishing regulations were because they engaged in near real-time management where they would have staff that would uh, run DNA at night to figure out what was the stock complex. They would do test fishing on a day-to-day -day basis. They were bringing in information on, uh, on uh, the abundance of fish using hydroacoustic counting facilities. So 20 years ago in the Fraser River, they were engaged in near real-time management. And I think there's opportunity to do this uh, in other places. Uh, the Fraser River isn't the only place that is uh, important. And there's opportunity to harness that technology and apply it elsewhere. And so, so this is the vision, this idea of having a fisheries management dashboard that brings in together all the knowledge and data and evidence that we are generating helps managers get it in a usable form and gives them a set of, of tools that they can easily select from and uh, apply in near real time. So this is definitely a vision for the future. Uh, I would argue that this is all attainable, um, but it is change and, and, and how we do things. And change is never easy. And that's why we're doing the kind of work that Andrew Howarth talked about yesterday, where we're talking to managers uh, trying to understand how they do things today, what works, what doesn't, where are those opportunities for us to bring new technology in, but do it in a way that will overcome some of those those barriers. So I see this this idea uh, fitting nicely with some of the uh, information that, that he shared yesterday. Uh, it will certainly help us to fine tune this and the very specific things we're trying to do with eDNA and, and omics as part of GenFish. So to be clear, this is not meant to replace fish squeezing. Uh, I promise, uh, you know, young folks in the room, if you become a fisheries manager, my goal is not to uh, gamify your life. So you just sit in front of a, a tablet uh, 247. Um, or make folks any more office bound, but it's about it's about supplementing that and harnessing the technology that already exists to benefit ecosystems and people. I do acknowledge that we need to figure out how to bring in other knowledges in a respectful and meaningful way. Uh, I don't pretend to to have the answers on on how to do that. Uh, but the world is changing. We need to be more responsive or we're always going to be playing catch up. I would submit that we can do better and Genfish can help. 
and that a dynamic world demands dynamic fisheries management. With that, I'd like to thank the co-conspirators that you can see here. And in fact, we have a paper that was just published. It's open access. It's online in the journal Environmental Technology and Innovation. The title's a little bit different, but it's functionally the message that I just shared with you. Uh, it's about technoscience and the modernization of freshwater fisheries assessment and management. So with that, I will say thank you. Uh, and I don't know what you want to do with respect to questions for Tina and I, but uh, I'm certainly willing to lurk around. Thanks. Over. Grab me over lunch. You can't do Steve necessarily. Yeah, Daniel. So, Steve, I have a question for you. In your model, you had feedback to the management decisions. My experience with managers, academic managers, is the last thing they want is feedback on their decisions. How do you think fisheries managers would feel about practitioners saying they didn't like their decisions? So whenever a decision is made, it's almost certain that there will be a component of the community that disagrees with what was done and a component of the community that supports what was done. So I don't think that's that's new. Uh, and certainly this would give a platform for people to to have their say. But in many ways, it would ideally be done on the front end. So you knew what those challenges were, why people were were potentially upset with a potential change, and then you could use that in your rollout to uh, to explain why. So if everybody was upset because you know uh, you know they they thought this is the world how the world worked you would be able to hopefully build a case using evidence and working with communications experts to help dispel some of those uh, those challenges. Uh, I do think that that fisheries managers appreciate input and interaction with various resource users. Uh, and if this could be done in a way that it allowed them to aggregate that instead of their phone ringing off the hook and uh, uh, and dealing with uh, angry emails to the, the minister's office and so on, it may in fact be uh, be more useful and could even serve as a source of data in and of itself. Any other questions? Excellent. I got another one. Oh, sure. Lay it on. This is, I think, for John. John, do you perceive the decision making toolkit in software? Well, yeah, yeah. Sort of like that's a sort of I didn't really think would be anything else. So it would be like a an app on your phone, type them, I'm exaggerating. Uh, I haven't gone that far. Yeah, I agree. But, but, I mean, yeah, I mean, the decision making toolkit, the software component of it, it's not something I'm, so I don't have the expertise to design it. I will be certainly providing, let's call this content to the software app, but um, whether it's something you can put on your phone or uh, I'll just have on your desktop computer. I not sure. It would be nice to have it on your phone, but maybe too complicated for that. Mm -hmm. We have a little way to go before we get to thinking about the actual software infrastructure. It, it occurs to me that certainly for activity three and four, we're going to need to develop software that will analyze and interpret the raw data generated by the chip. And uh, you know, I'm going to be talking to some people about reaching out to computer science and maybe bringing in a new partner who could code what we need code with a nice front end. And now I'm starting to think maybe we need that for all the deliverables. Well, actually, I don't know, Tina, if you remember, but you and I talked about this about a year ago. Yeah. And that's sort of the conclusion we were coming to as well. Yeah. That we might need to bring in a some kind of expert that can 
actually put all the content into a nice sort of software structure. Yeah. It comes down to waiting. I think it's the same thing, right? If this, then that. So the user would have to wait how much it is important. And then behind the scenes, it has to do all through the calculations and produce a number, you know, like klaxons go off. It's like, stay away. Or, but it, but it all depends on, and it'll be tailored towards the different users. And so they'll have to put in, what is your idea of social acceptability? Like, who's your social? Um, and like I know Tangji looks at social acceptance in the broad general public. So let's say government deals more with the public acceptability. And you're just talking about that with Steve in terms of, you know, the ringing phone. And so they'll wait that. And then at the end of the day, it'll be like, okay, this is your three points in favor of this versus that. But that has to happen all behind the scenes and have a really nice GUI, right? Graphical user interface. And John, I think that's where we're going. And so they just they just do sliders, they fill, they click buttons. But everything is going on, going on behind the scenes. So I don't know if you want that to be as interactive for your other two activities, because it, it's just more like, how do I interpret it? It's not as interactive. It's more of a static. And it's almost like your results have to be filtered through and then fill out a template. Mm -hmm. So you input the results, and then it goes and it gets translated into a template where it fills in, this is what it means. And so that's what you then deliver. So you deliver a static product, but it's generated through CompSci. And for activity five, the user would like to want to game it, saying, okay, well, that's the outcome. What if I'm less risk averse? Well, that's up to them to do that, right? So at the end of the day, they'll, they have to make that decision on their own. It's like you're saying, we step back as researchers. And so if they want to game the system, it's up to them. They don't want to accept it. But again, you, you know, they have to mark what they're, you know, on a, on a lever or a, a slider between zero and five, how important social acceptance is. You know the cost. You know how much are they willing to put in versus conventional? Those are the kind of things. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, Tom. You go ahead, please. Um, so a general question for this type of software: Do you foresee that people will adopt the software first before huh. they adopt the toolkits, or do you think you know they're going to adopt the toolkits, make that decision first, and then? You tell them this is something that can actually help. Well, our own users are pretty keen on our toolkits. I think it's for other users, mm -hmm. right? Potentially for other ENGOs or other industry. Because again, the whole point is not to make it just within our own little realm, but to commercialize it beyond our immediate partners. And do you think the, uh, the development of this uh, software can actually help you promote the toolkits among other people? Or I think so. Sure. Sorry, John, please answer. It's really two types of decisions, whether to adopt or not adopt descriptive technology, because that can be very disruptive for an organization. And, and the second decision is once you have adopted it, uh, sort of the more micro decisions. Yeah. Where should I, where should I use it, where should I not use it, that sort of thing. Yeah. But I would agree with you that the answer is uh, to be yes to both types of decisions, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thanks for contributing. Bob. I mean, at the risk of stating the obvious, I think we can all envision data dashboards and evidence-based decision-making, but even with eDNA, we don't even have a data aggregator for this occurrence data yet. And when I talk to DFO, they're like, oh, well, it's not an R mandate to host an eDNA database. And I talk to Environment Canada, well, it's not an R mandate. Um, you know, I think this is one of the big problems I have with Genome Canada, is, you know, in, in our government more generally, where is the durable infrastructure? So in the U.S., they have the eDNA atlas, and so they've populated it with data on bull trout across the entire Intermountain West. They've been able to then run climate change scenarios and say, well, these are the habitats that are still likely to support bull trout under a two or a four or eight degree warming scenario, so let's prioritize protecting those areas first. There are examples of this. But without even a place to aggregate that data, we'll never get to a dashboard. We'll never get to evidence-based decision making. So how the hell do we overcome this? That's a barrier. That's clear cut. And it's probably beyond our ability to solve it. Oh, absolutely. But I think that's kind of one of the things that we have to push. Otherwise, Genfish is just a project. It ends when the project ends. We yeah. get some cool papers out. But the bar isn't moving forward. And so I think it's, it's a huge barrier that we have to figure out how to deal with. There's your next genome Canada. And I know I'm being facetious, but. It's not genomics, it's data science. Yeah. yeah. Anyone have solutions to that? This is a really good point. 
is it just a question of finances and or I mean like you're 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 changing you're asking for a huge change to happen it needs to happen but we need someone to instigate that and it has to happen I think in the, amongst the different resource you sector uses right and they have their own constraints or are you gonna try to solve the problem no I'm gonna make it worse <laughs> this was identified as a primary concern of the bloody ROC for their next meeting. So what the heck are you going to do with the data to make sure it's archived long term and that it's accessible and that it's usable? And we're going, okay, well, let's get another grant to do that. <laughs> well, and when I've talked to folks uh, in the U.S. Forest Service about their EDNA atlas, in principle, they weren't opposed to perhaps extending it to Canada. But, you know, then there are also some questions about, well, will we put sensitive data on a non-Canadian server? And, you know, I'm just not seeing much appetite in Canada, frankly, to solve some of these bigger data science problems. We're mm -hmm. generating the data. We could use the data. People want the data, but no one's going to set up an EDN agenda in Canada. I'm thinking of the Ocean Tracking Network, and Steve could talk about that a little bit more, how there's a lot of data that's shared amongst even across borders, and everyone has access to it. But first, Nick. That, that, yeah, that ocean track, tracking network might be a good model to look at because analogous to uh, what Bob was just saying about eDNA in Canada for 20 years, we've been trying to get a, a national AIS database. Mm -hmm. And he even said, why don't we just piggyback on the USGS one? And they wouldn't allow it. The other day, wouldn't provide the actual data, uh, a database in Canada. So the solution is probably not within the existing existing government uh, policies, mm. but that is definitely a problem. Steve, what do you think? Yeah, so obviously OTN has had and benefited from a massive amount of CFI funding uh, to which is really about that infrastructure support side of things. Uh, but it, it took years to get things up and running and interoperable. And, you know, they they maintain a staff, uh, I think it's five or six people on their database team. So it's it's not small potatoes. Um, that is an international effort, even though it's, you know, based in Canada, uh, it serves the international community. So, yeah, but I, I do think in general, there's some really interesting parallels. I think telemetry is another one where we actually saw managers really jump on board with telemetry about 15 years ago, where managers were running out doing tagging studies. And then they realized, holy crap, this generates a pile of data and you need somebody with, you know, a PhD and three postdocs to analyze it. And that's where we continue to sort of be stalled out in terms of being relevant, especially in a temporal scale to management. If it takes three years from when you've got the data downloaded to get your answer, that's a problem. And so one of the the most promising developments I've seen there is um, uh, a science transfer project funded by the Great Lakes Fishery Commission to develop an interface for Lake Erie telemetry data. So they're starting off with just Lake Erie and just walleye. Uh, they've tagged thousands of walleye, uh, and, but creating a tool that can be queried and and um, used by managers and so they've been working on that and it, it's sort of coming to a point where it's mature enough to share so it might be worthwhile having some conversations with that group uh but but that still has to be scaled up we're talking about one species one lake uh, <laughs> so yeah th we're not the only ones struggling with these issues the thing is we have sat and we've got pedro on this grant and I think it's worthwhile to potentially reach out and have those kind of discussions too, because it's big data management. It's all about that. And what and they they've got the connections. They might also have additional ideas to help us, you know, because those are legitimate questions. And you saw that I don't know, Bob when, and that that was one of it: infrastructure accessibility, big data management. And the closest thing we've got in Canada to something like this is Polybear's barcode of life data. Mm. And that's serving as a network node for the entire world. And there's still no sustainable long-term funding for it. He's having to go grant cycle to grant cycle. And kudos to Paul for having pulled this off in more than a decade. But there, that's still at risk of being unplugged. And that's one of the things we have global leadership in. Yeah. Yeah. Ken. Um, 
I don't know. In terms, it won't be very accessible, but it's long-term data storage. Uh, what used to be called Compute Canada, which mm. I had to look it up, is now the Digital Research Alliance of Canada, the Alliance. Uh, that has free accessible uh, serve, remote servers for data storage for academics. And that's really well maintained. And, and at least there's professionals who do the curation for the individual servers themselves. I wonder if there's a way that we could tap into that. Yeah. That is a sustainable long term solution to at least mm -hmm. moving data around. So here's the thing, we're supposed to create these toolkits and turn them over because sometimes we're going to have independent, it's not just always going to be universities working. The whole point is there might be some that want to do it in-house. And when it's done in-house, then it's potentially, Daniel, correct me if I'm wrong here, let's say uh, Thermo Fisher wants to get involved or the government wants to have their own STP, their, their next-gen sequencer themselves, or an environmental consultant wants to do it. Would it how do we tackle that same question you have? Because now it's they're interfacing with the the end user. It's no longer us, and so you're going to have now multiple parties involved. So the whole point is this is this is supposed to outgrow us, but the ROC wants us to come up with a solution to handle that once it's beyond our walls. I would throw it back at the rock and say that's your problem to help us solve because it's bigger than ten fish. Yeah. You guys are going to be worth your weight in gold. You know, you help us come up with some ideas. Yeah. Yeah. Trevor. Yeah, I just want to jump in too. This we have a meeting today about the uh, business advisory committee, and part of it is about commercializing some of these things. So one of the things I didn't hear talk about, maybe you guys can see even see it in comment, is on the cost to the users. Uh, something that we haven't talked about, or the intellectual property linked to these tools. Is this something you want open access, or is it something that you think might be an opportunity for commercialization after GenFish or during GenFish? And this is something that will come up later today. Uh, we have Heather Crack coming to talk about commercialization, but just something for a lot of scientists don't think about, not some do, but many don't think about commercialization. But it's something that has to be on people's radars when we have these conversations. So I just want to bring that up. And if you want to see talk about that, Heather's going to talk about it at 1 o'clock in here uh, for 15 minutes. Okay, great. Thanks. Daniel. Once it leaves GenFish, mm -hmm. then it's up to the adopters whether they want their data to be proprietary or not. And I would see environmental consulting dealing with their clients might very well want their data to be proprietary. Comes back to the point that was made yesterday, I think, about all this data that's hiding behind consulting walls. Yeah. Where they have acted on behalf of a, of a client. And I think that kind of data is either is going to be lost or it's going to take a client who's going to have sort of the, the, the bigger picture and willing to let their data go. But again, it's beyond us. It's not our problem, really. Yeah. But it is our problem to make sure that information that we generate within GenFish is available short and medium term. And we have to have a plan for that. But what we are trying to do is patent, aren't we? Well, that's what Trevor was saying. And that, you know, Genome Canada would love that. I don't know if it's an option. <laughs> well, I think today in an open golf kind of movement of having data transparency with the government, they're not going to be buying any proprietary data. But then there's a potential model for some of these databases that use AI as great case law that legal firms tap into and pay big bucks to have subscriptions for. So, I mean, there are models that you, know, you could imagine, but you know, obviously as a, as a biodiversity conservation guy, I'm morally opposed to having biodiversity data sitting behind the table. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, join, oh, yeah, go ahead, Nick. I say another potential model, uh, maybe thinking about this a little differently, is that museums um, manage these types of data. Why don't they, you know, we, we could ask them if they would um, they would uh, treat the eDNA results as accessions in their in their uh, digital collections, mm -hmm. and because they're already linked to like GBIF and all the global networks, where you could, then the, it could be it'd be part of any search. 
yeah. that anyone could do globally. Uh, if you, um, you know, museums are in the, in the, the uh, business of managing not just physical mm -hmm. uh, collections, now, but also digital, for example. Good point. E even that's wrong, you can send them a photograph and they'll like session it. And that, that's now a did, like considered a digital voucher. And so these are eDNA vouchers. Right, so that maybe that's the, the more creative way to doing it. Of course, they need to be funded as well, but uh, it's not like we'd be creating something from scratch. Yeah. So then, how do we create enough of a movement to try to make it happen? I don't, you know, we can we could write another policy paper, we could write another opinion paper, um, but until you know, there's more voices and there's a real need for it, and then the funding opens up. I think we're still kind of stuck with just offering these toolkits and then saying data management, data infrastructure is, you know, it's not yet, but here are some avenues that are worth pursuing. And I know I'm, I'm selfishly talking about what we can say to Genome Canada, but that's not solving the answer. That is a legitimate problem. So one thing that I uh, predict will happen is at the end of um, GenFish, if we produce the tools that we're supposed to, I think the end users might be reaching out to individual researchers within GenFish and offer to partner with them, potentially funded through government or other funding agencies, to continue the partnership. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think they're going to take the technology and run with it and, and we'll never hear about it again. I think that the relationships may uh, continue and new relationships generated if our tools work and people like them. Because mm -hmm. I think there'll always be an interest in getting a scientist on board who's going to know, you know, the ins and outs of when the eDNA doesn't give what you expect, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. It's that diffusion that Tongji talks about too. Exactly. Yeah. So to end on a happy note, we've got lunch coming, I think. But Margaret's been taking down all these points um, because these are answers we're going to be addressing. Uh, in the rock in our next report. So thank you all for all, for sharing all of that. Good points. Thanks everybody. All right. So welcome back after the lunch break. Uh, for those of you still here in attendance, uh, my name is Trevor Pitcher. If I haven't had a chance to speak with you. And uh, part of my role in GenFish, other than actually doing research along with you, is to help uh, guide the uh, Business Advisory Committee. And that is, the key word is guide. And so we have a lot of partners on the committee, uh, including uh, one of the speakers today, that's Heather Pratt, who's the Executive Director of uh, Office of Research Innovation Services here at the University of Windsor. There's Heather. Hi, Heather. And uh, we're privileged today to have two things going on with regards to the Business Advisory Committee. So we wanted to have a quick talk. Heather's going to give a quick overview about uh, commercialization prospects in general terms. And the idea here, as you saw today and yesterday, is that we're getting to a point when the chip is soon to be available. We're talking about developing novel software. And so where are potential commercialization opportunities going to happen? And what does that look like? A lot of us that do a lot of these sciences and social sciences may not have as much experience with commercialization. And so this affords an opportunity today to hear a few minutes about Heather's uh, summary on this. And then after this, we have a closed door meeting quickly with the Business Advisory Committee about sort of flushing out possible opportunities for uh, either licensing, you know, under commercialization or intellectual property. So if you have questions about those issues after today, you can always approach one of us and we can get you the right resources to look at that more carefully. All right, so without further ado, let me again uh, pass the baton over to Heather. Thank you. Thank you, Trevor. Um, and Paige, did you want me to share my screen or were you going to do that? Uh, I'm happy to do it. I, I can do it then. I, I can advance I can advance the slides. Just give me a minute. So I also have with me today uh, Vesna Caps from my office and uh, Vesna is our um, contract and um, technology transfer manager. Um, she's also a lawyer, so very well versed in things, all things related to IP. So we'll really quickly give a quick guide, an overview of technology transfer and commercialization. Um, and we have quite a few slides, but we'll try to get through very quickly. So first, 
This is general information on the patent process, and um, this is no substitute for any kind of legal advice at all. If you um, do have anything specific, you should always be contacting a patent lawyer or a patent agent um, for, for any legal advice. Um, the content is solely for the purpose of discussion and illustration today and is, again, not considered legal advice. And it is uh, not to be construed as representing in any way the corporate views or advice the University of Windsor nor Genfish. Um, so the learning outcomes from today to first understand the various forms of intellectual property, property specifically patents, uh, recognize intellectual property opportunities and considerations in your research, and most importantly, when you should be um, keeping things confidential versus um, and the timing in terms of publication or presentations, and then learning about intellectual property pitfalls and how not to ruin a potential patent. So what is intellectual property? Intellectual property refers to ideas, inventions, or technologies which are creations of the human mind that can have real world outcomes to benefit society. So protecting IP, what it can do, it can help to protect that uh, intellectual property that you've generated from commercially, um, others from using it for commercial purposes, uh, can prevent unauthorized copying or imitation and can provide you with competitive advantage if you are taking it to market or spinning out a company. What protecting IP does not do, it does not guarantee you the rights to fully make, produce or provide a product or service when um, IP is based on others. So the forms of intellectual property, very quickly, I won't go into the details, and I, I think Paige has this um, slide deck as well. So we have copyright, and copyright can be literary, artistic, musical, and dramatic works. It's automatic. So there is a very uh, low cost or low to no cost. Um, in Canada, the life is um, plus 50 years, changing to 70 years under NAFTA. And um, that what the copyright provides is unauthorized copying, disseminating, online, translating, etc. Uh, industrial design is another form of intellectual property and that will cover design features of useful products. Um, you know, if you're original, eye appealing, that uh, industrial design can protect your um, intellectual property for 10 years. Patents is what we're going to focus on our discussion on today. Patent is any new or useful non-obvious product or process. Registration is required. It is a very expensive process and it does take some time. Uh, it will provide you, though, 20 years of protection from date of filing, and it will prevent any un unauthorized ma manufacturing, using, or selling of your intellectual property. Um, trademarks as well. You can see we've got the, the Starbucks trademark, and you don't always see that TM. Uh, the trademark is a distinctive mark associated with product or services. Um, it is um, a very cost-effective way of protecting um, your intellectual property, there is a registration is required, but um, it does provide you some protection for 10 years and with a renewal. And then trade secrets, a good example of trade secrets is Kentucky Fried Chicken or KFC, which will enable you to um, keep your, your intellectual property confidential um, based on that secret. It is automatic, um, very low entry fee, but it is very difficult to keep that, that trade secret um, protected. So the intellectual property strategy is very important as well. So it, the IP strategy is really the plan that you want to develop to help you to monetize and commercialize your intellectual property to help you achieve your business objectives. So um, Trevor was mentioning, you know, the, the sensors and things, you know, if, if you're with the view of, you know, if you're looking to spin out a company, that you want to be sure that you have a, um, an IP strategy to help you monetize the IP that your company would be formed around. Um, your IP can be used offensively to protect from competitors, defensively to ensure freedom of operation, um, again, to generate revenue through the licensing, and it can help you to build an ecosystem of, oops, sorry, help you build an ecosystem of, um, to become an industry standard. And now I will pass it over to uh, Vesna Caps to talk about the IP ownership. Hi, everybody. With respect to IP ownership, it means it's associated with other agreements and policies. Like it could be covered under a collective agreement, employment contracts, your research agreements with industry, university-wide policies. So before you create something or you believe that you've created something, you, you should come to whichever research office, technology transfer office to, do, to talk about your idea before you proceed further. Okay. Next slide here. Okay, variations. 
various universities have different types of policies. The University of Windsor is one of those where under our collective agreement, we are a creator inventor owned policy. There are some entities that have jointly owned and others which have institution owned. Now with patents, remember there are their their legal their legal instruments, they're country by country to protect for new useful inventions. They have a utility. Remember, they are not aesthetic. It's not like a industrial design. We are, it's for 20 years. Remember a patent is almost, it's like a social contract. You have 20 years from the filing and then it becomes generic public domain. You, you, have, you have go through a very rigorous examination process, which can take years. And they also have the requirement of annual of annual or fees throughout the 20 year process, which are different for each and every country. Remember, they don't give you the right to make use or sell the invention, only the right to legally prevent others from doing it. Okay, the three criteria for a patent, it must be novel or new. It must have a utility, a purpose and it must be non-obvious to a person skilled in the field. So the third one is usually the trickiest because if a patent if a patent examiner in the US Patent Office or the Canadian Patent Office goes in there saying, hey, anybody who is skilled in this is, would have thought of this improvement or this invention, then, it can, then it's considered a public, uh, public domain and it's not patentable. Now remember, each country has their own guidelines, their own, own costs, and key feature must be confidential. Otherwise, it's considered public domain. So make sure whether you submit that journal article, that poster, the, those grant applications, whether those grant applications are considered confidential or public. The US ones are often considered public. So before you submit anything to the US, please make sure that you know whether it's considered a confidential application or an open application. Thank you, yes. So Vezna, I'm gonna jump in just for one second because of our time constraint. So the one part we were really hoping to hear more about today is that commercialization down a little bit further because a lot of the attendees came to the last IP meeting that you helped with. Okay. Sorry, sorry to interrupt, sorry. It's just that this is what, We'd appreciate if we can go down to numbers 20, slide 20, if possible. Sorry, Heather. No, that's okay. I just want to, like, you know, really quickly, like, sure, technology yeah, there, transfer yeah. and commercialization, like, there's quite an extensive process here. So the discovery, the disclosure, evaluation, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, questions you need to ask yourself. Do I have an idea? That's the discovery stage. What do we know about it? Invention disclosure. Who funded it? You need to be be aware of the the any research agreements or contracts that might be in place. Is there a market for it? The evaluation process and, and when do you file that patent? Can we find a license licensee and what's the value? Um, we do have, there's a nice um, kind of flow chart here as well, but really the commercialization pathways, you know, when you have that that technology, the, the invention's been disclosed, it's been protected now, you, you, you're obviously looking for licensing opportunities but you're also going to be needing to look for research funding because probably the technology readiness level, the TRL level is still pretty low. You might have tested and validated within your lab, um, but it might need to be advanced a little bit further. So there's research funding opportunities that you can, you can look at. Commercialization pathway as well as creating a company or selling the company um, or selling the services as well. Um, in terms of the licensing agreement, you know that there's quite a process there. So from the company perspective, they would get the access to the innovations, um, which would help to support product development, commercial sales, and, and revenue sharing. And uh, you know, there's uh, we can support that at the University of Windsor and the tech transfer offices at um, the partner institutions would be able to support that as well. Um, in terms of fund, finding funding to develop your IP, there's always this valley of death, right? Everybody knows about the valley of death because this is like the, the, the lower TRI levels where we get funding from governments and universities and, you know, looking for that funding to bridge this gap to advance that TRI level beyond that proof of concept in the lab and to, you know, proof of concept testing validation out in the private sector so that it can ultimately become a commercialized product. 
Um, again, you can reach out to your tech transfer offices at your, at your respective institutions, see if they have um, any institutional funding. I know that some institutions do have funding to support um, bridging this gap. Uh, there's also funding from you know, angel and venture capitals as well that can sometimes help bridge that gap. I would mentioned the TRL level. So TRL level, this is a nice chart. So TRL level one is very basic fundamental research that you know would be, you know, I think discovery grants would be TRL level one, two, and maybe three. Um, again, the valley of death here is you know the the technology development, and then you know when you get most companies want to see a TRL level at a seven through nine, and um, there's more information on the the link here for the um, that can provide some more details there. So some of the funding that's available to develop your intellectual property, the, the program that we utilize quite extensively at the university is NSERC Idea to Innovation or Eye to Eye. They have several stages and the funding program helps you to, um, uh, you know, initially there's a market assessment uh, program, which gives you some really good market intelligence that helps you kind of frame your strategy in terms of, do you want to license? Do you want to start up a company? How do you want to how do you want to move this forward in terms of commercializing? The, we've got a firm that gives us a great report, some great intelligence as well, and, and also provides us with some um, company names and contacts that can help us in identifying possible receptors. The next is the phase one. It's $125,000. All of that funding is from NSERC, but we do you do need to have an industry partner that expresses some interest that should the, should the development through the phase one proved to be successful that they would be interested in further developing it. Um, but they do not, the company does not need to provide funding at that stage. The phase two though, there is funding required from the um, any industry partner. Uh, but to be quite honest with you, the, the leverage that might be available is probably better through an alliance grant. Um, the, the, the ratios here in phase two are, are not as good, but you can access funding up, up to 350,000. Uh, there's also a new program, Lab to Market, I2I I Partnership. Uh, that's being led actually out of Ryerson, and that provides a good um, educational training program for HQP that might be interested in starting up a company as well. And we have secured a couple of those. It's a relatively early program, but it is something that uh, we're seeing more uptake on. So in terms of the negotiation, you want to be sure you claim your value and create value, and you need to build trust. You want to build trust with the potential licensee that you're talking about. And you know, just be aware of some of the trickle, tricky legal discussions um, in regards to genes and patentability. I'm not going to go into detail here, just given the time constraints. Um, suggestions and improvements um, in IP in an academic setting. I can't reinforce enough the importance of ensuring if you do think you have anything of commercial value, this would apply to all of your students, your own publications, um, even a poster could jeopardize a patent filing that you might not find out about until you've sunk $100,000 into protecting the IP. During the office action, um, the, the patent examiner might identify that, and we have experienced that. We have had, we've gone down that pathway, thought we did a complete prior art search, and you know, had a student presentation from you know three or four years before that actually you know, nullified any opportunity for us to continue with that patent. Um, suggestions to implement best practices: work with your tech transfer offices. There's, um, you know, when there's greater inventor involvement throughout that process, it you know makes you more aware of the opportunities as well, and makes you aware of the. Um, the importance of protecting your intellectual property and, and maintaining that confidentiality and, you know, really, you know, continue to create that groundbreaking research, but, you know, just always ask yourself that question, is there an opportunity for some commercial value here? And should I talk to the tech transfer office to see if we might want to consider filing a provisional patent or starting down that patent um, pathway? And that is it. Three minutes over, Trevor. Thank you, Heather. No, yeah, really appreciate it. So I think before we th thank Heather, so thank you, Heather. I think a couple of the new take homes today, just to drive them home, and I won't drive home all the take homes, but one of them I think that always struck me is that researchers often think that, you know, their product is ready for market, but it's usually a large gap between what's called tech ready, and Heather showed a nice diagram about that. And so oftentimes if you have a possible product for commercialization, you might need to access that I2I I to bring it up to industry standards. So that's something that in my conversations with colleagues have always not realized how far down they are on that chain. They think, you know, this is ready for a lab because I did it in my lab, but for industry, it's nowhere near ready. So there's grants to kind of bridge that difference 
And that's something that's new to a lot of us here today, or potentially new to some of you. And the second part of this that we've talked about at the last intellectual property session was not to put up a poster somewhere or post online. If, you've dis if you haven't discussed with your supervisor or you know, someone, sometimes you can give away your intellectual property rights very readily, and then that causes problems down the line, as Heather mentioned. So when in doubt, one of the messages, the third one probably is talk to your tech transfer office uh, at your respective universities. So I think that's Trevor, really the main messaging. Go ahead, Heather, sorry. Sorry, Trevor, if I can just add as well, like there's a really good process that, you know, customer validation is really important when you're assessing that potential intellectual property and that commercial value. You might think that you've solved a great problem, but, you know, you need to reach out to potential customers, potential receptors to really test that because oftentimes, and I've heard this from industry where they say, I've had a faculty member come to me with this great technology, but this is not a problem for us. So you really need to work through, um, I like to use the business model canvas and really customer validation is the starting point of that, really to identify, does this meet a gap? Does this meet a need? Does it solve a problem for industry? And is there potential there? Because if it's a problem that you think that somebody has and you haven't validated, you're gonna sink a lot of money into a patent. Perfect, yep, thank you again. Thanks. All right, so my understanding is a 10 minute break for most people, but for the people on the business advisory committee, we have a short meeting next door, closed door meeting, uh, but for the rest of you, I believe there's a bio break for the next 10 minutes. All right? Thanks everybody. Have a good day. So we're gonna we're gonna go ahead and get started. Uh, the, the folks in the business advisory committee will be coming back soon, but I just want to make sure that we all have enough time to have as much discussion as we all like. Uh, this first is the uh, FISH Survey Toolkit Breakout Discussion Group, um, so we can continue some of the discussions from this morning after uh, Margaret and Nick's uh, presentation. So I'll give the floor to you both if you'd like. Yeah, so I didn't have anything formal planned at all. It was more or less a, a continuation of this morning's uh, uh, discussions and, and, and questions. Daniel. <laughs> yeah, uh, discussion point. Logistics of actually validating 220 eDNA species specific assays across three uh, fragments, three genes. Yeah, yeah, and that's good. And that, yeah, that, that's sort of a continuation of what, yeah, Scott and I were just discussing that, yeah, that I don't think it, that by any stretch of the imagination we have to test, you know, 218 species against all other 217 species for every single assay that I think what we've been doing and most labs have been doing is uh, any closely related species and so congeneric, con familial. I mean that uh, for some families, we aren't doing all species in the in the family. They're, they're rather large, but just anything that is phylogenetically close uh, if they're good, anything that in the in silico uh, analysis suggests that it might potentially bind, even if it's not particularly closely related. And then that's what we're sort of calling validation, that uh, part of what I think is really important is reporting uh, what you've tested it against. And so you aren't just saying it's species specific, you're saying it's species specific against these seven confamilial uh, species. And so then people know uh, in their region what what has been tested. And then if they have two additional species in that family that they want to test, then they can do that do that test. And then um, and then like what we were talking about before that there's still the if you you know if you're doing you do the in silico looks good you do the in vitro in vitro on the on the possible uh, species of concern and it's good. In situ, it's looking like it, it's testing positive where you expect it to, uh, and and not where it uh, isn't expected. And uh, do some uh, amplicon sequencing to double check to make sure that what you're amplifying is your your species. And then again, report reporting everything. And so then, people who go to use it, they can then decide. Okay, that looks quite rigorous, and for my uses, that's good. You know, in, 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 a, in the case of an invasive species, maybe they have to be extra sure. And, and then, oh yes, and something else too. Yeah, so that that's per one assay. So if you want to make sure that it's not a false negative, because maybe that's your bigger concern, 
um, and you, you use two or three assays for, for redundancy, or if you, you want to make sure it's not a false positive. Yeah, so that, so that I think that uh, that, that level of, of validation is definitely better than what most published assays have. Um, maybe not as good as, I mean, that there are some assays for, like I'm, I'm like for Asian carp where there's so much riding on, on a, a positive um, in terms of, you know, the, the legal ramifications and the, the financial ramifications that there, there might be sort of a, a year or two uh, effort into validating one or two assays for a few species. And, and we don't have that, that luxury and I don't think we, we need to. So, so I think that, uh, and then what, what I think is nice now with activity one is that each individual lab sort of, uh, just because of the, the, the time constraints, sort of each individual lab was starting off sort of doing a lot of the validation uh, their own way, which had a lot of similarities, but now the more that we're seeing what works, what doesn't work, what's the most efficient and, and talking more, I think that we're getting more to a, a, a standardized validation protocol, which is what, as you know, yeah, uh, Matt and Corey have, in the, have been working on. And I think that will be very efficient because we have to be realistic that we need efficiency and not you know, just not perfection uh, uh, with one assay every two months. It would seem to me that what species to test against in vitro is going to become somewhat arbitrary. So it may be one lab will decide congeners is fine, and others might say confamilial or cherry pick across. Would it make sense to create a database of pairwise genetic distance based on sequences, and then say this genetic distance or less you need to test? In some ways, that is appealing because it seems a lot more uh, objective, but we aren't necessarily looking at overall genetic similarity. We're looking at similarity at the primer and probe sequences. And so I, so I think we can use you know, uh, genus and family as an a, a easy guideline just because that's that's uh, readily known from the from the existing classification and then I think uh, if I'm remembering correctly uh, Matt and Corey were talking about sort of like a six mismatches or fewer for primers both primers combined is a, a red flag make sure you're testing that and so that not phylogenetic relationship in general across, say, the entire mitochondrial genome, but looking specifically at those, the primer and probe regions. So it occurs to me that what we're referring to is Matt and Corey's paper, something we need to do. Yes. If we're Matt or Corey there, if Corey's there, <laughs> Corey, are you going to say anything about that? Yeah, so Mark is correct. Yeah, we're shooting for uh, a total of six or less um, mismatches. I would just like to say to, uh, I'm sure that Corey and Matt are aware of this, but the location of the mismatches is very important as well. And like in my assay validation, I found that. Um, I would have um, species that I would be testing for non-target amplification, and I was almost certain from my in silico validation that it was not combined because it had so many mismatches, but the location of the mismatches were not in the places that they needed to be. Uh, so it ended up binding. It was a, you know, a later amplification, but uh, the location of those mismatches should be noted as well um, and should be considered. Yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that because that's something that you definitely found, didn't you, Stephen? That you were you were taking <coughs> into account the position and nature of, of mismatches when you were predicting. Yeah, it's always the type, so the, the, yeah. The, yeah. 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 
Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I'm glad you mentioned that because I know it's not part of your your thesis, Stephen. But one thing that uh, Bob and I were talking about was it about uh, identifying um, some 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 samples within each of some of your different classes and doing empirical testing, and so that the in silico analysis when I'm looking at not just the number of, of mismatches, but the position and nature of mismatches, it's predicting that it would bind or it wouldn't bind, and then in testing that empirically to see how, whether we can refine it even beyond the, yeah, beyond the the, the generalized number of mismatches. That, that is something that Matt and myself are working on. Um, we've started to run in, however, to the issue of if we start having to empirically test all those mismatches, um, we start running into why it's taking so long um, to develop these assays. So what we've kind of not settled on just yet, but what we're, where we're kind of going is at least um, setting the requirement of reporting where those are, um, and then only empirically testing um, a subsample of those uh, mismatches. Yeah, no, I agree, and that's exactly the sort of thing that we were thinking of with 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 Stevens, because re for for Stephen and for the two of you, recognizing it's a master's thesis and it has to end at at at, at some point, and then also recognizing that when we're doing this for 218 species, three assays, we have to uh, be efficient as well. But yeah, sort of identifying, okay, well, you know, here's one that. Uh, looks like it would result in false positives or here are three that look like they would result in false positives and then testing those three and, and getting sort of a, a sampling of the different uh, classes to see uh, whether the in silico uh, 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 analysis is you know, more stringent less stringent than reality you know bang on just to sort of get an idea of how much how much trial, how much in vitro trial and error can we eliminate um, so that we're not having to test five at primer and probe combinations for every assay that that we can get pretty good at recognizing um, in silico what will what will work. And I'm saying that without having done any of this myself. So. <laughs> I think I think this discussion, of course, is including activity too, is it not? Yeah. So uh, don't let me monopolize, uh, uh, Nick, if you're wanting to come up oh, too. Cool, cool. <laughs> uh, what's the third gene again? And what's the status of uh, that development? I think we're going to yeah, we're going to do 12s. We had in the proposal we had talked about a nuclear gene, but I just don't think that's okay. realistic. 12s because it's being used for for metabarcoding. It just seemed to be yeah. a a good one to to add. I'm sort of thinking about using eDNA species-specific assays that some of the labs produced. One of the things that speaks volumes is the actual sensitivity or standard curve, because you could plot a line on there, but at lower sensitivity, the variability can be huge in terms of CT. Would people in general be comfortable with us? With us asking them to put their sensitivity or standard curves on the GenFish website for published assays, like to, is there to go to go to authors of published assays and ask them to the share ones, that? Oh, the ones that oh. The GenFish, like, oh, I see. So, like Corey and, and uh, uh, Matt's, for example, I don't, I don't think they would care, but I don't know whether I would be comfortable in putting those up. But that's that gives you a lot of information about how good an assay is looking at how it behaves if you dilute your target. Yeah. Yeah, so some of some of you that are doing more of this, you know, actually in the lab, how much of the information that we would report do you think captures some of that or do you really would you really want to see the standard curve to make some of those calls yourself or are there some some stats that people can report that would that would capture that? Are we talking about we have published the, this assay already and now we're adding this information or mm -hmm. as we're doing this? As you're doing it. So like if you were yeah, reporting on, on say you've developed an, an assay and that if you were reporting, say if you said you did a you know, 
10 point in the standard curve and you, you, you gave the range of your dilutions and you reported what your LOD was and defined your LOD. Would, if you, would, do you think that would sort of capture all of the key information or do you think there's still additional information that you really need to see the standard yeah. curve to be able to? Yeah, I think that goes back to the same conversation of the uh, standardization of assay validation because if we're doing different methods for um, even something as simple as like how we're defining LOD and LOQ or different methods for serial dilution or some people are using tissue extracted DNA, some people are using t uh that information can be very wide um, But uh, And I think even your standard curve can vary based on your like master mix, your recipe, all sorts of stuff. So um, I know like in the case of like Cam and I sharing sharing assays, but like you know the, with the lamprey assays, um, I'm doing my set of LOQ, LOD, standard curves, all that kind of stuff, and then Cam starts using it, he's gonna have to do it all over again with his machines, his cutting. Uh, there's even a variation in Pipe heading when you do standard curves. Yeah, yeah. It could give you a general idea, but you would have to do this on the small. Okay. Yeah, and so, yeah, so the, I, mean, I know we this, the discussion that uh, Corey led this summer on teams that people were participating in, that was great in terms of the, 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 the back and forth of information. Yeah, and so I guess, I mean, that we talk about, or at least I talk about sort of that, that uh, transparency in reporting, maybe that there's a, a limit you can't have necessarily, you know, 50 columns in a, in a spreadsheet, but deciding like, is it important that you report, you know, what thermocycler you, you used, um, master mix or something like, how many things do we need to report <laughs> and, and how many things, uh, it would just be overkill to, to report. Yeah. Yeah. And, I, and the, the nice thing I think with, um, we're, there's going to be variations within the activity one group, but, it, but I suspect, especially once uh, each group gets going, it'll be sort of a bit standardized within each lab. And so there might be four different variations rather than 218 different variations at least. I have a question for Nick. He's still awake? Yeah, I'm sure. <laughs> What's the possibility of giving the list of water bodies that we have generated as being sampled to SAPNA to see whether there's overlap with what you've got data for or what percent will go? That's a good idea. You do that. It might be handy to know that for the ROC in the new year. Yeah, excellent. Okay, we'll do that. Um, and then I just wanted to follow up on. The earlier discussion we're talking, you know, where I suggested maybe a museum is the best way to to uh, curate our data. Well, uh, Matthew's, you know, we have been having discussions with the Canadian Museum of Nature about the, the extractions and, 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 and curating the extractions. Uh, Matthew is going to expand that discussion to, you know, the additional data. The and I didn't realize it was extractions from the 500 water body data set. But what's missing there is the, the individual species identifications from each one of those extractions. And so um, Matthew, and, and if I can, I'll join, um, uh, we'll talk with Roger about, you know, doing a slight species level curation um, so that, that it, it, for example, the example I gave earlier, so that, uh, uh, if you were searching in GBIF for for a species, that it would come up as well. So uh, there is an avenue for, for us to ex explore that uh, further with the Canadian Museum of Nature. And Nick, I, I know you're more aware of this than me, but I'm conscious of there is sort of a, a tension between the ROM Museum of Nature. Did the ROM boat sail, or are they still a possibility? Well, uh, well, the problem with the ROM is they need money for everything, right? And I, I you know, if I was to bet online, I'd bet on the Museum of Nature. 
uh, just because of, of uh, uh, the financial constraints of the raw. Yeah, and we've been working with Roger on the Deepwater Sculpin project, and he couldn't be more collegial and helpful and everything. Yeah, so based on, on that, yeah. He was also the one who came up with museum might solve some of the ethical issues that came up with Amy yesterday. Yes, yeah. Which struck me. Of course, they have many culturally sensitive items yeah. that they have to be careful with. Yes. Yes, and I'm assuming the same with data sensitive species for, for conservation. Yeah, and I, yeah, because when you mentioned the possibility of you know, the, the museum being a, the, the museum sort of maybe taking this, this, this over at some point, that yeah, I mean, there's no point in us trying to reinvent the, the wheel if they've already got a lot of that sort of archiving, especially the dig digital archives sort of set up and, and anything related to the ethics or data sensitive species. Maybe we should invite Roger to the next ROC. I think, yeah, maybe, well, let's see how the discussion goes. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I should show you pictures of how he has uh, rejigged the, the DIY uh, pump they all, when we were out on 31 Mile Lake in Penny, that uh, a nice block of wood that you just put the drill into and you, you slide a piece of wood in so it holds the holds the, the trigger on the thing and they yeah no it's it was it was a it, it was amazing we were done the f filtering all three biological replicates within 10 minutes tops yeah it, it wasn't uh, changing the slot hole with a uh, with, with uh, a <laughs> Make that a slot hole, right? Oh. The drill always slides on it. Yeah, it was certainly useful, like when you're like sampling off a boat, but carting that like, down to the shore would have been pretty long. Yes, yeah. Oh, what the Roger had? Yeah, yeah. It's yeah. yeah. like yeah. a little cumbersome if you're going to be floating it like, to the shore. Well, I say yes. just replace that one, that one little bolt <laughs> with one that has a Robert Center or a Phillips. And uh, you sold nine percent of the, the frustration. <laughs> <laughs> you always risk driving the the slot drill bit into your hand. Uh, so if you flip <laughs> the drill around and just connect the drill bit correctly to the out, like the sticking out point on the back, it sealed perfectly. Like you don't have that issue. I guess we didn't think outside the box. <laughs> the GFO takes credit for that. I just learned that from them because they're like, we tried this, it worked way better. I was like, all right, I'll start using that. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. No. Yeah, because I can't remember now that they had quite a nice, I saw a, a photograph of it, quite a nice setup on the tailgate of the, the truck or something like yeah, that. Yeah, so what they actually started using, I mean, this might not work for everyone because not everyone just has a bunch of Masterflex pumps sitting around, but they took sort of the external bits of the DIY and did away with sort of the drill, drill pump and just threaded the, I think, size 15 DIY hosing through a Masterflex pump. And so they have a wooden tripod, they put the Masterflex pump on top thread it through and then they just have a constant cycle of water bottles being collected and then the filter chain is quite easy on the back end as well. And the big they use it, uh, and uh, we need uh, like a, a flat surface and so on. Yeah, so they, um, for treatment purposes, they already post master flex pumps that feed uh, a tin up into the water. Um, so they have these like nice wooden tripods that have a flat top, so they just bring those out to the side of the river but use the exact same process for you can make Is this a batch nose group? Uh, the uh, Sea Lab Prey Control Center. Yeah, yeah in, in Sault Ste. Marie. We need pictures. Do you have a picture of Shelby's setup for filtering? No, I wanted everyone to send me everything. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, one of my students' husband is a machinist. And so she set up a system for the the three filtering manifold into a um, pump, and then a car battery with an inverter, all in this aluminum frame, 
And if the charger for the car battery is attached too, so you just plug it in overnight and then it runs all day on the car battery. So I'm, I'm smiling. I'm thinking that the 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 intellectual property that we're gonna it won't be anything to do with molecular tools. It'll be all of these little uh, little mechanical uh, devices the, um, for filtration. Well, including the uh, maybe I shouldn't say that, but including the, uh, the the bottle in which there is a 3D printed file for the drone, right? Uh, and basically told that guy you should patent it. And, could be quite a bit of money going into the future. But, um, well, and then of course, uh, Ian's been using the Osmos just as a pump with a manifold, and uh, that makes it extremely quick as well. But it's pretty, you know, the Osmos is a pretty expensive pump, uh, but it works really well. Bob would have more information. I think that there are some groups working on it, and it, my short answer, and Bob can provide more information, is that yes, people are working on it. They're very, very stringent, and so that we probably couldn't get through 218 times three assays if we had to do it that stringently. And so we're trying to make sure they're still very good. But maybe, yeah, am I sort of interpreting that correctly? Yeah, and there, I've heard a few different people saying they're writing the IT guidelines for EDNA, you know, it hasn't come out yet, and they haven't said, you know, hey, let's open this up to the community. So I don't know. Uh, I think the iTrack DNA project that's just been funded with the Karen Heller and William and Apache working with the Standards Association to set a standard around some of this with industry. Uh, the DFO is going to accept this kind of data in a regulatory context, then you have to follow the CSA standard. So they're, they're pushing on that. That was part of their team in Canada. Yeah, and, and the DFO and then that uh, workshop a couple of years ago, I just read the uh, workshop proceedings. They spent a lot of time discussing standards, regulatory standards. Yeah, yeah, and which is, yeah completely understandable if it's being used for yeah, things that would have, you know, very uh, um, serious, yeah, legal management ramifications. Yeah, that it, that may not be the level that we need for a lot of ours. And, and so, yeah, just trying to, to make sure that we're balancing yeah, what's feasible with, with still, yeah, really uh, robust um, assays. And then something else that came up in the last ROC report and that Bob and I have been discussing as well related to our, our C lamprey eDNA work is some cross lab validation because I know yeah Brooklyn you were mentioning about yeah and, uh, differences just uh, to, to see you know, how much of a difference I mean that there yes yeah, so that yes you if you get a little bit of a difference in LOD LOQ but are there drastic differences if you're going from lab to lab. So that's something that is, yeah, so that, yeah, species specificity or some of those uh, bigger um, bigger things, whether they completely fall apart as soon as you're doing it on a different platform or whether it's just details versus uh, the big the big stuff. One thing we will say around that in terms of LOD, uh, we've been using the finest method in our lab and then Darren's team published their ELO quant method, and I was pretty grumpy about it because they wanted you to do eight tag routes. But what we found when we started trying ELO quant is some of our things that were borderline were coming up into more legitimate detection. So it does seem to give you a bit of a, a lower limit of detection than what we brought with the quantist method, but it does involve running a few more technical routes. Another thing to consider because if she's pushing that as the standard anyway, and it gives you a little bit better sensitivity, then it may be worth us thinking about using when we roll this out for more uh, app applied cases.
it nothing else? So I guess yeah. So uh, and I don't know whether yeah whether there were anything anything more specifically with activity two or whether we want to you know, pass it on to you, Daniel, now for activity three. Because I think it was the way for two o'clock was for the for activities three and four. Is that correct? It's true. But if there was more questions, we have The one thing was thinking of, maybe I missed it because it was in the business meeting, but um, with respect to the work that Eric has been doing around these blind spots, and if people have data where they've used the MyFish primers and, and want to share uh, what they've detected with that or, or not, when they think it's there, um, we use the half a dozen data sets that we have in my lab to get a good start on that. Um, yeah, folks are interested in knowing more about that blind spot tracker. I'll help contribute to that. So, activity three, activity four. One of the overlaps is environmental RNA um, and you can imagine how attractive that is to our partners. So Yellow Island Aquaculture loves the idea of being able to take a water sample and determine whether the fish on the average in that particular tank are stressed. And I can imagine others, particularly hatcheries, would be interested in that. But as soon as you're working with environmental RNA, you're working with eDNA with the nasty twist that it degrades and you look at it. So it's it's a tough one. Matthew, do you want to comment a bit about what you're doing with environmental RNA? Sure thing. Um, yeah, so it's a tricky question. It's to be determined whether or not we can use it to kind of make inferences based off of what you're doing. I uh, did an experiment last year um, at uh, Freck, down at Freck, Trevor's factory that came in there, and uh, where we exposed salmon, genetic salmon, to uh, heat treatments, and then collected our ERA from those samples as well as tissue samples, which you need to help in the process um, for the chips. And then, uh, and yeah, we're going to get to see whether or not we can pick up any, any, uh, any uh, transpotomic signals. Uh, from the heat stress in the environmental RNA. Um, this is based off of a kind of project that I conducted uh, in a previous lab, um, in, in a previous postdoc, I asked them to kind of pilot to see whether we could do that. We are actually working with a bit of a signal from adaptive, so I don't know if we see how we can do this with a larger organism, the fish. And then I think that um, the STP chips in particular was a really interesting opportunity to do this. We already have kind of a template of potential assays that we could use to target your stressors. Um, so, yeah, we're going to see how we can implement those assays, which we need to do on it. And use them as a partner. Because they're kind of two different approaches. You can take a like, broad scale approach where you try to sequence everything. The problem is there's a lot of RNA microorganisms that kind of drowns out the. Uh, And uh, yesterday, uh, Blandine, who's uh, Brian Dixon's master student, was talking about her eRNA and e protein work with the uh, rainbow trout, and, the, and her preliminary results in the rainbow trout were startling. 
So she had no problem detecting cytokine protein and mes and messenger RNA in the in the uh, slime in the mucus, uh, but she also was able to detect the uh, the cDNA using um, individual uh, TACMAN assays in the water, but the protein, the environmental protein in the filters, were not uh, were not detectable reliably. Yeah. There's there are some interesting as well as kind of like advocate for the potential feasibility of this approach too. Um, there's kind of multiple labs pursuing this with, for different things. I'm looking at the temperature stressor because that's what I was funded by and certainly you. Um, but there are other folks looking at other questions. And I remember seeing a presentation this summer at ESA um, from a student from Karen Goldberg's lab who was looking at ERNA to try to detect uh, different like history stages of Amphibians, basically, whether or not they can see like metamorphosized adults and distinguish a signal from them relative to juveniles. And they were having some success, and even implementing theirs in the wild, they were having some success in mm -hmm. detecting the presence of, I think it was detecting the presence of adults, not the presence of juveniles. I can't remember specifically which one they were looking for. I think it was the adults that they were looking for. They were looking at like characterization gene expression or something like that. So like skin gene expression, because there's like a ton of changes that happen in the middle side of amphibians. But they, they reported in the patient that they were having some success. So it seems like looking in, in the environmental RNA for this type of stuff is uh, potentially feasible. So it's kind of that being a really exciting to explore in the future. I mean, it, it makes a big difference too, because like for the well-being of fish and the birds themselves, you can just you know, sample the water to determine the condition of a fish, or like if there's a particular stressor that you're interested in, heat stressors or a pathogen or something like that. Um, instead of having to take these like lethal samples or even stressful non-lethal samples that like the deeper that we're talking about, if we just look at the water instead and see if we can pick up a signal using kind of like a target approach, then that's you know that's a lot of advantages for the welfare of organ. Well it's interesting because They've been doing that for cortisol for a while, yeah. right? Yeah. Nick, using the water. Yeah. But in that case, what you do is you concentrate the, the particular protein. In the case of nucleic acids, you amplify it, yeah. which, which essentially is the same idea to detect something that's really dilute. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think that the potential for ERNA is high just because of the power of PCR. You know, if you can find really, it's, you design a sensitive acid. Really low level of, of you know, these molecules. So, yeah, I mean, that's something to know or express under certain conditions, like a heat shock protein or like immune response to heat or something like that. But, yeah, I think it has potential in the middle of this. I can't, <laughs> I can't uh, confirm that, but it's still pretty pretty preliminary at this stage here, and it's pretty new, but it's not going to be still preliminary. Can I give a shot with my sample from my yeah, that's going to be interesting. Yeah. <laughs> John? So you're interested in the health of fish, but you know, from this discussion, it sounds like you can infer information about the health of the environment in which they live as well. Fisheries, you're interested, fisheries managers are interested in the health of fish. We also have environmental managers who are interested in the health of the environment, the water in this case. And I, I suspect they don't talk to each other very much. I'm not sure about that, but it seems to me, I don't know, it's just listening to this, it seems to me that the two genfish toolkit may be a conduit through which these two groups would be able to interact and actually get the same, well, not the same information, but they can both get the information they want from the same tool. Yeah. yeah. And that's a really cool idea, John, and that the ROC was harassing um, harassing us to, what's the damn little minnow they wanted us to work with? Fathead the fathead minnow. And that could be sort of the, the canary in a coal mine and develop a specific chip, put those fish into a water body and then use ERNA to see whether the water quality is good or bad. Sort of like, look at it from the opposite point of view. I'd never thought of that. That's kind of cool. Have we done anything with the fathead? I mean, the fathead minnow? <laughs> <laughs>
You'd think so. Yeah, the 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 chief we were the water was second in India. We actually put the fatty amino acid and so on because it's a uh, it's pretty available on all the uh, gene sequence data for fatty and fatty amino. Mm -hmm. So we designed the second chief we we put fatty. Yeah. Other plans for the RNA samples on the chip. We're gonna. That is, in fact, what Shahin and Landine with with them. Um, okay. the, the idea is, we know that the chip does reduce sensitivity simply because the volume of the assay is smaller, so you have fewer molecules, target molecules. Um, but we're hopeful. One thing we might be able to do with that. This is a Do a preliminary screening with uh, tissue and see what genes, if the volume ends up being tissue, you can do a preliminary screening with tissue on a chip to see what out of from tissue types that are likely to be represented in the ER, you know, like mucus, skin, um, potentially ill, but also digestive tract stuff, to see what the hits off of for the STD chip and then just use the assays directly on the sample. Part of the, the goal of the STP chip is to identify genes that respond very dynamically. So the idea is to get ones that would be very sensitive. So fingers crossed that the, the assays we've got will work with environmental RNA as well. I'm, I'm cautiously optimistic. Well, you could amplify the RNA. Too. Yeah, so make cDNA and then put it through a couple of rounds yeah. of amplification. The nice thing about that is the open array chip is limited by how much cDNA you can load onto it. So you can't just have super concentrated cDNA. Um, not sure why it would fail if you put too much cDNA, but probably just hindrance. Um, but then if you did sort of targeted amplification four or five rounds before you put it on the on the chip, it might make a big difference. The other challenge is that the eRNA is going to be incredibly unstable. And, and I don't think RNA later is going to be a good solution because the stuff's going to float off into the RNA later. Yeah. So it, it might be you have to flash freeze at minus 80. Yeah, that's something that I think that a lot of will need to be done in the coming year. If we, can, if we can get the preliminary stuff working, under like best case scenario, we're like draft flash freezing things. Like an important next step would be to kind of see what all its limits in terms of practical application. Yeah. But if you, if this sample in the RNA, could you do something like high speed centrifugation to perhaps concentrate it a little bit? It, yeah, something, something like that. I, I'm hoping it's going to be easier rather than harder. Sort of like when eDNA first came out, everybody thought this is going to be impossible. And, and you know, now we get cottagers taking eDNA samples, so you can always hope for the best. The, um, the, uh, one of the things that came up that, that I, at this yesterday's talk, was uh, the um, circadian rhythm genes. And my one of my career goals is looking for the silver bullet for determining whether a fish is coping or not coping. And 
At one point it was cortisol. <laughs> and now I don't trust that one. And gene transcription profiling is my latest, but it hit me that the, I bet that stress would cause circadian rhythm to go um, awry. And I don't think any of Phil's people are here, but it really struck me when, when his student was showing that the dark, dark cycle was just a perfect sinusoidal curve for these fish that are not being stressed. I wonder what happened if the fish were stressed, you turn off the lights, would they maintain the free running um, circadian rhythm? And how fast, and because you could easily quantify how far it degrades. And if we could pick up circadian genes with eRNA, you just take a water sample from the fish that are in the dark. I thought that was cool. Yeah, one key thing about the eRNA today is it's worthwhile to mention is that it's um, it be a bit challenging to get down to the taxonomically specific level that you can with the DNA. I think it's because the um, yeah, genes tend to be more conserved, I think, if you express one of those ways. But my hope is that we'll be able to do things about this stuff. Kind of like when you get a few of the chips, we have like proteins and some minor chips and stuff. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. But I mean, it's still like that applications for like, I think when King thing is, if you're going to a natural ecosystem, it's probably not going to work with all the like low density species that are rare. But I think that everybody's kind of view on the environmental biomolecule is clouded by how EDNA is used to, or like preconceived notions of how EDNA is used to look for rare species. You know, if you know that the perpetrator are inhabiting a lake, you're not ever going to think that they're the only fish in the lake, they're in a high abundance, like if you lakes, it's going to be my study. Nobody would ever go in there and search for the EDNA and the very little perpetrator are there. Um, so it's kind of like EDNA is set up to look for rare species, and what people are thinking of when they apply EDNA a lot of the times. So and the RNA, if you're applying these natural systems, you want to target the like species that are very commonly occurring. In order to generate even more information, but I, I would be skeptical that you could apply it even for rare species that are in natural ecosystems. But if you have a lake that's fully inhabited by brook trout, and you're interested in you know kind of adjusting the maybe regulating those shipping climates or something like that, you might stand a chance that I get the yarn and say one of those types of circumstances in the natural ecosystem. I think it is. <laughs> oh. I just to respond to that, and then Ken, you're. I would say that the eRNA app, e application will always be with captive fish. So you go to you go to those brook trout lakes, and you grab a few, put them in a yeah. tub, let them sit for a while, take the water, and then let them go. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so I think that the transcriptional profiling is always going to involve some, well, not always, usually some handling. With the possible exception of those goldfish ponds, yeah, exactly. where there's probably gallons of RNA floating around in there as well. Well, the application I always think about when I try to like, think in my head about, about these things, I'm like, all right, what would be the next step to try to validate this? If we can get it working in the lab, what's the next step to validate it in a natural ecosystem? Is us spawning Pacific salmon, a very top block building in those streams. And I think that we were interested in looking at like thermal stress. Sam, you do ER, it would be a good study system. You just go get it in there. The spotting runs going on. You know, get them like pedigree of pools for a thousand fish per in the seventies. Yeah. I know, but they were really super stressed out in that condition anyways, though. Yeah. So I'm not sure it might be I mean the cars up like through the roof when it's yeah. dying. So that might obscure like the thermal signals that you're looking for. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you have to see whether or not you can get something specific to specific stressor. But if you have a general stress marker, yeah, they're going to get, you're going to get hits off of that. Like, I think the whole group, you can identify specific threats, like a pattern or a thermal stress marker or something like that. I don't know yeah. if that's realistic or not, but we'll, we'll see. Yeah. Yeah, you you know, you know, better off getting a stress marker than you have a spawning ground, and we'll all, because those responding ground themselves are usually quite 
by the next school, my computer will be off and we'll yeah. be yeah. rearing, but they're just they're dying and you're completely diseased at that point, so you can really detect the immune response. Yeah. Oh, you're my next. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's actually a really, yeah, <laughs> digital droplet. It's it's sort of like we're already Ford people. <laughs> Chrysler might be better, but we've got the Ford. Um, so we've gone with with TACMAN QPCR, the digital droplet has some real advantages in terms of, I think, better determination of, of um, melting curves and stuff like that. Uh, and I read three, four years ago, confident predictions that all eDNA was gonna switch to digital droplet. And it looks like that's not happening. Bob? I would just say on that note, um, we play with it a fair bit. And it's when you dilute out the inhibitors, you might be able to get away with not having to do an inhibitor cleanup, but it hasn't given us any better sensitivity than QPCR mm -hmm. with a cleaned up sample. And you can only run about 16 samples at a time, at least the machine we have, and it's a lot more expensive. So we've walked away from PDPCR. We thought it was going to be this great, wonderful thing. And mm -hmm. we're doing high volume screening and stuff. We've done virtually no advantage to it. Now, the, the bull trout stuff they're doing down in the in the U.S. Um, Central Western, isn't that all digital drop it or is that QPCR? Do you know, Bob? And originally, it was all QPCR. Okay. I know they've been talking about trying to move to digital droplet, and maybe they have for that assay, but historically, when they were doing a huge screening across the whole in the mountain west, and that was all QPCR. Yeah. Anything more anybody wants to bring up? The um, We talked a little bit at the break about software for transcriptional profiling and it was brought up i thought it was something i hadn't thought of but of course it's very different from activity five this is the said way um that the transcriptional profile software that we need to develop simply takes the messy data and does the the preliminary analysis and provide multiple ways of interpreting the signal so it's sort of you take the data and you process it and you make it look good as opposed to the stuff that was proposed in activity five is much more interactive. So it's going to be far more, I think, challenging and sophisticated. But I think that the software ne is necessary for activity four to really start getting uptake because you just look at that data that comes off the open array as, as Nick Bourdais did at lunch it is it is not user friendly data in my opinion anyways yeah uh, i'm not sure how how knowledge it is there's this grand data curves at u of t but the red analysis group at u of t has like a nice interface for that i called the bar i don't know what it stands for but they have like tons of uh historical data on their analysis and what affects stress, stress and what genes are up regulated wet years, dry years, that kind of stuff. They'll show you like which parts of the plant that target where that overexpression occurs. And I could imagine maybe a similar thing where it's actually just take the heat map and converse it into like a picture and make it a little bit easier for people to understand. Okay. So if it was something that was like ontogeny or self on it, you could maybe have light stages and show where you would expect that heightened signal of a certain gene or mm -hmm. regulation of a certain gene at different light stages or in different stressors. It's just really a pictogram approach to a heat map, which might be a little bit mm -hmm. more readily understandable. Yeah. No, maybe I'll reach out to you about that. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah, it, 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 you can't do this probably as cleanly as neuroanalysis group just because of all the, the model system mm -hmm. stuff. But I can add ways to make a turn. Are you trying Is to? Is it a bioanalytic resource? Uh, bar? Sounds right. Neuroanalysis is probably one of it. You type in bar and then neuroanalysis. Yeah. Of course, it, you raise something, Alex, that just every time anybody says that, it makes me shudder in horror. And that is life stage. <laughs> and what, at some point, that bloody ROC is going to say, 
What about life stage? Are you going to have a totally set of, you know, the, the 14 stressors and 42 species? Now we have five life stages. Yeah, just run out of the room. <laughs> if I had any hair, I'd pull it out. As long as it's at the last meeting. <laughs> After we spent all the money. Are you looking at sex? Oh, jeez. <laughs> Luckily, I have scotch in my office. <laughs> Tina. How about interpretation of the results of the heat map? Who is that? Uh, who's responsible for that? Because there's going to be some implications. If you're saying, yes, this shows that they're suffering from, you're making a definitive statement. Mm -hmm. Or do you qualify it? There's a high likelihood that. And then if you've got some that are only a couple of express genes that are your panel, that are part of, let's say, the heat stress that nothing else likes up. So it depends on how many numbers of genes are running up and the degree to which they're laying up. How is it going to get, what are your thoughts on the interpretation of the data? Yeah, it was a really good question. First of all, the person who's in charge of this is Shahin. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I think you're absolutely right that it's not simply going to be a yes or no. It's going to be a, sort of a probabilistic likelihood type response that is going to be interpreted as, you know, there's a sort of like when you do ancestry.ca, you know, you're 20% uh, Irish and 40% Scottish and that same kind of thing where, okay, the signal is showing this um, with these uncertainty levels. So it's not, it's not, I, when I indicated that it's sort of a data analysis program, it's not just a pipeline to generate a heat map. It's also an interpretive based on all the experiments we're doing. That's my my vision for it. I mean, with the heat map, like if you do the class trialysis, you generate uh, like different classification on the top based on different species and on the side based on different genes as well. So you do the class trialysis on the top and side as well. So you could say, mm -hmm. but uh, you could classify them in both ways. If you like, uh, I have seen many papers that they do classify like the generic heat map only by gene wise, just do the uh, cluster analysis on the side. Mm -hmm. But uh, in my some of my papers, yeah, I usually prefer like doing classification in both ways, like on the top, mm -hmm. classify different spaces or even like different tissues on the side. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yeah. There are a number of ways of, of presenting it. Good. Anything else on activity three, four? Tina, you know, do you or one of your team want to lead a discussion on activity five? Sure. I can, I'll, I'll be the messenger, no problem. Um, so, activity five, we're going to be talking about a really good point because we were having discussions over lunch in terms of, okay, what is our decision toolkit going to look like? And then what kind of data are we going to present? And what I was thinking of, we're going to have to probably have a, a little bit of like a, a video lesson to send to the and to provide to the end users in terms of okay what can it do for you to help them make their decision not so much like a propaganda piece but part of it would be okay this would be um, the look of the report that you would get so this is where we'd have let's say a mock-up of the heat map and then how it'd be interpreted and it would tell you this with this probabilistic and one of the questions is is this enough for you to make your decision because again there's that uncertainty we have to be transparent about where the uncertainty lies we can't guarantee anything that, that this is a certain a certitude that's easy for me to visualize for the SDP chip and the health toolkit because I'm, I'm much more steep on that side. So I'd like to ask the eDNA people if we had to um, present to the end user who's not involved with us, but um, what the output would be that you would be giving them and how they could use that data, again, in a short little video clip, what can that be and what would that look like? So can I get suggestions from anyone in the audience? Okay, I'll start with Bob. Yeah. So we built a little tool called the Indie Mapper for collating qPCR data for ADNA. And you mark out your standard curve data, your raw fluorescence data, your GPS coordinates, your technical routes. So you can sort of keep all of your reference data in that place, plus visualize the results. Mm -hmm. So to see on the landscape, a little pie chart, oh, I've got two out of eight detections here, yeah. and there. Um, but that's one of the challenges that we've seen is it would benefit from having a little video about how to use it. Um, we think 
that that you know would be a nice thing perhaps for Jennifer to be able to say, well, here's a first pass and you know a system that you can use with the kind of data dashboard, you not know, like archive and raw data but visualize it. Exactly. And I think that's what they're looking for, I think, right? The resource um, sector users. And is that something that we think that GenFish can deliver? And we we've, we've have little videos. Pages put little videos on the GenFish website, but that's just like, how do you collect? How do you not invasively sample? There might be other videos. I'm sorry, Paige, that's on our website. Uh, I think there are. OK. And like Margaret's already said that part of her GLFC science transfer program working with eDNA, correct me if I'm wrong, was kind of like a flow chart in terms yeah. of, did you see this? Yeah. Um, have you looked at that? But that's one way for like, say, data quality and how do you assess it? But it's more like, OK, which is uh, incredibly important, but GenFish's product, what is it going to look like? How can you interpret it? How can you then potentially use it? And I think that's what we should be focusing on as well. So we're talking Activity 5 that in the next six months, it's time to bring on a postdoc to be able to do this and um, start collating all this information and potentially these videos before we actually build and start to quantify the weighting of all these issues. But I think we want to start, um, again, Tongji, Amy, and uh, John pipe in here. This is what we want to show for our decision toolkit. It has to be associated with information on the type of use and what we can do. So we need it from the eDNA people, and we need it from the STP chip people as well with some input. But it really is a huge collective project at this point. have a lot of GenFish projects and a lot of GenFish adjacent projects that all sort of do overlap. And yeah, I mean, the ND mapper is really very nice in terms of yeah. Yeah, recording all of the details that you need, but then also being able to visualize it on the map. And then with the GLFC science transfer project, uh, project you have to have pages doing all of the, you know, sort of the interactive, you know, side of things, and it'll be, really quite nice when it's all done. It's, it's largely, you should say, from the sort of quality control side of things, it's so that the fisheries managers can interpret eDNA data that they're given to them by the eDNA practitioners, but it, it will sort of look like a simple like checklist of, yeah. you know, is, do you have a negative control, this, that, and if I'm remembering correctly, sort of like generating a report at the at the end. And, and, and so it, it yeah. It's really, yeah, I mean, it's really very... Yeah, can we put it up, Paige? That'd be yeah. amazing, because that would be great to even show in the video. Like, this is what you can get. This is what you would use. But you'd also get, and here's the quality control to make sure that you have faith in the results and you trust the results, but then this is how you can use them and interpret them, which I think yeah. is, to go side by side, is really important. Yeah, so, so instead of what we as academics, we tend to have our big, long list of, well, make sure you do this, make sure you do this, make sure you do that. This is rather, it is just, did I do this? You know, check, and it's just like, Check, check, and then at the end, what the decision is, which is just so much more user-friendly than mm -hmm. the okay. okay. We just kind of um, workshopped the interactive select control tree uh, with you know information that you could select that would take you to another a publication, uh, or if these are just kind of sample questions, but the, depending on what you select, you're allowed to move forward or you're given a warning. So for those who can't read, I'll just read for those in the back. Uh, so were the communities of interest fully identified with common and Latin names of species recorded? So I think Nick would really love that question. Um, yes, let's say. Nick, I was very careful to say fishes and not fish. It is scientific, you're right. Uh, yes, yeah, so this is why you want Nick to uh, proofread what we do. Um, but no, and I'm, I'm joking, but it's really important that we know that. Um, consideration number three were the larger study areas and specific sampling locations indicated on legible maps. Consideration number four, the methods and materials used for sample collection, handling, and preservation were recorded. So what happens if it's yet or yes? Yep. Okay, and no? Concern, appropriate sample collection protocols should be recorded for reproducibility and reliability. Yeah, yeah, I really, really like that. Consideration number five, what if you say no? 
So, so procedures were implemented to control error during sampling, collection, and handling. So what do you, like, so would they understand what that source of error would be? Good question. These are very uh, high level preliminary placeholder texts. So no worries. No, no, no. Okay. Yeah. Because again, there's this whole error propagation. What's well, that? Contamination is a big deal. There are. Right. You know, okay. Replace error with contamination. Yeah. 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 And okay. Then also, just uh, as another example, we have the full. Oh, I didn't. Oh, yeah, this. Okay. A full like static tree that one can follow on their own. That's great. So this is just kind of the kind of tool that we're developing for fisheries managers that I think can easily kind of pivoted into other other considerations or decision based applications. Yeah. yeah. So not just fishery managers, but like, would you see this? I know this is for the GLFC, but for non-fishery managers. So, you know, community members, indigenous community members, or ENGOs that are responsible for this, I think it would still apply. So like, is this widely applicable to resource users? And that's what we want to hit. We want to hit like general targets too. Yeah. Daniel. I really like your idea of videos. Because something that I hadn't thought of that John brought up is that the the decision making toolkit is not just a tool for people who've adopted it, but possibly something that would recruit people who should adopt it or should consider it and might not. Yeah. And so if it's just jumping in and you need data, it's not that useful for for you know uh, bringing people in. But if it includes sort of a demo. Yeah. Thank you. When you're making videos, I'm available on very close demo. Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> you have the face for radio. Okay. <laughs> Did you want to say, sorry, add something, Paige? No, just maybe about the chip. Oh, yeah, that's right. Yeah, and there's a there's a huge barrier of, of knowledge of what the chip is. So that would be a first thing, I think, to, to get over that stumbling block. Did you want to talk about the STP, not the chip, but the GLFC application that we put in that we're waiting on? Why don't you talk about it? because I don't remember all the details of it, but it's to work with fishery managers and it's to hold workshops about people's knowledge on omics in general, which include um, transcript omics. But it's it's um, holding it so that we could create a type of flow diagram or flow chart at the end. And again, so this is like eDNA related, but for us, we also have one in the, in the works to get funding for with the Great Lakes Fishery Commission on the omic side of things to say, okay, when is it appropriate to use which types of omics, whether it's proteomics, metabolomics, or transcriptomics, and not so much eDNA, I don't believe. No eDNA. Yeah, and it is, would be a series of workshops where we would have potentially some surveys and questions, and part of it would get to what is your level of knowledge, and then what's the concern for you, what would you would use it for? So those same kind of probing questions um, that I think Activity 5 members would be really keen to potentially participate in. I know some of them are already on the grant, but Paige, you're pretty instrumental in putting that proposal together. Do you want to fill in any of the gaps I've missed? I'm um, sure part of it would be just kind of massive literature review of just the state of knowledge of omics at the beginning. And then I think one workshop that we would conduct surveys before and after on um, what do you know, what you, have you learned from gathering together as researchers, and then how do you think you and then eventually um, it would be making graphic uh, education materials that would then be put on a dedicated web page that would serve as an information hub for managers to come back and, and be able to reference um, when, when using all these tools mm -hmm. that kind of correct to the spirit of it. And it's targeting Great Lake fishery managers specifically, specifically because they're going to get moments shoved down their throat and they want to have education tools about uh, strengths and weaknesses. And very similar to what you've got for the EDNA, how do you know when you're being snowed? Yeah. And I think we could crib some of that, though, to, to apply it directly for the, the GenFish SDP yeah. chip. So they know, OK, this is when you would use it. This is how you would use it. Here are some videos on how to collect the data in, non-invasively, which we have some videos on. Um, yeah, so that's our that's our vision for Activity 5 as well, to help build up to make sure that the decision-making toolkit really has as much information as possible and nice short sound bites or with, with graphics so we don't get user fatigue um, to make sure that they could make a best decision. 
and then of course with links in terms of like here's more information here's who you can contact etc but these are preliminary ideas and we will sketch something together we'll we can pass it by you and on your um your partners as well as we as john likes to say as we beta test it out and part of that would be hiring a co-op student in computer science to be able to actually realize this behind the scenes to do all the technical but we'd be looking for a postdoc a social science postdoc who might have some resource management background um, to help organize everything and to start talking to our end user committee that we have start talking to collating all the information amongst all of you so when you do get emails from them this is why so in, in the next six to 12 months we'll be ramping this up john yeah just wondered, what you, of all the omics Disciplines you mentioned, you forgot one. Economics. <laughs> <laughs> of course. Yeah, that's the base on which it, yeah, it sets. If you don't have the money, you can't do it. Yeah. Any other questions or comments or concerns or things we should be on the lookout for? Any other bear, like, have you identified? I know with Amy, we talked about barriers. Um, any other barriers you can think of to potentially the health chip? I know we didn't get into that too, too much. There's a knowledge barrier, but. Yeah, Daniel. I think it's going to be cost. Cost. You know, because I, I, the reality is, is that doing the transcriptional profiling, it's going to clock in at 15 to $20 a fish. Mm. You know, and there's no way around that. One of the comments of the ROC is, like, how are you going to make this affordable? And I went through the calculation, and, and if you did individual assays, it would be like $250. So $18 isn't bad, but it's still a lot of money per fish. Yeah. But I do, you know. What's the minimum sample size? Well, that's the point. That's something we're going to find out. Okay. Yeah. So there's minimum sample size costs, and then what can you trade that off against in terms of doing a necropsy? Um, to try to find out why they're dying. But again, you can sell it as a prognostic tool. Mm -hmm. To say, okay, what are they potentially being exposed to? If you don't see a population signal of decline, doesn't necessarily mean that there isn't one. But I know that's kind of now fear-mongering, and that's not what we want to do. But if you suspect a stressor, you don't see a population decline, you, you, like you said, the first level of response is your expression response. Some might argue then, does that actually then translate up to a phenotypic response? Um, or are they, this is like the cortisol thing, is the high expression necessarily a bad thing? So here's another thing, okay, I'm starting to think of barriers. High expression or versus a dampened expression over your delta delta CT, is that indicative of tolerance or is that indicative, like uh, let's say um, Y tolerance range flexibility or is that indicative of a, of a stress response? How does one interpret that from a heat map? Shahin, is Shahin still here? He left right there. Yeah. He knew you could ask questions about the uh, I think so. baseline or uh, uh, stressors. No, it's the, that's a huge problem. Yeah. So no. A barrier associated with it, I think, is, is uh, that will be part of the, the tools that you're interested in developing in terms of the information you would need to get from the end user is. How much do you know about the environment? If you're going to apply this for environmental assessment of health, yeah. which is the end goal, I guess. Yeah. I think that the, the quality of the answer you're going to get from the expression profile will be related to how much you know about your environment. Mm. So if you have no baseline, uh, need to know basic environmental data. You need to have basic environmental data, mm -hmm. both biotic and abiotic. If, if you have none, your ability to actually extrapolate from the expression profile will be quite limited. The yeah. more you know about the abiotic, biotic conditions of your environment, the, the, mm. the, the more informative the information will be. Yeah. In my mind. Yeah. You know, that's true. An animal is living chronically in a very poor environment. That animal, of course, acclimates. And, and its ability to respond to an acute stressor is not the same as an animal you take from a pristine environment. Mm -hmm. We all know this intuitively. And if you have absolutely no knowledge of your environment in terms of this, once again, 
biotic and biotic signature, their ability to extrapolate from the expression profile is only very limited. Yeah, and I think that was raised before with acute versus chronic stressor. And then how does that change the expression? Yeah, the expression but profiles. On the, on the plus side is certainly what I'm finding and what other people have mentioned is that the people who are interested in using this typically have a pretty good idea what the problem is. And they're trying to determine, quantify how bad it is and how widespread it is. Yeah. So I don't, I don't, initially the idea was you go in and you have no idea and you just want to see what's going on and you do all 108 genes and that that was in my opinion cool but it was definitely naive mm -hmm. and in fact the fishery people the people who are in charge of managing the populations they typically have a pretty good idea i suspect sometimes they're wrong but they have a pretty good idea of what they think the problem is which mm -hmm. is why we're getting to the functional chip sub chips because they say we well, think this is because of invasive species or the you know trophic collapse or something like that I think that's still an important consideration to put in that decision flow diagram. If then decision tree, do you have if you have no information or no suspected stressors or no mm -hmm. idea, then you may be counterindicated. Yeah. Exactly. And exactly. How you incorporate that into that key? Oh, it won't be easy. Yeah. Like low, medium, high. Like we'd have to have broad categories, you know? Yeah. Categorization. Mm -hmm. but uh, just one of the things I think, the original idea behind this whole thing was not to have survey kit and health kit, but you use the health, the, the fish survey kit to monitor and detect decline in numbers of a particular species using eDNA. And you say, okay, and we've, we've, we've done 10,000 lakes instead of 500 that we could do traditionally, and the 10,000 lakes, these 50 are showing a five-year steady decline in eDNA signal. What the heck's going on? Then we go in there, catch some of the fish, and do the health check. Mm -hmm. That was the original concept behind this. It, again, it may not be doable, but that was the idea that they were actually linked. You do the survey, and then you do the more in-depth mm -hmm. approach. Okay, get Alex first, and then yeah. Andrew. Uh, I think another important thing to, to Probably a fold change in one gene isn't going to be the same issue for a fish as it fold does the same fold change in another gene. Like I imagine mm -hmm. some genes are probably upregulated much more than others just based on their amount of expression and the impact and the translational efficiency. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to get into the annoying translation protein issue too, but like like that, like, I think explaining that to an end user. I don't think we will. I don't think we can. We can say if it's this fold changed in this set of genes, don't worry about it. It actually means this. Yeah. Yes. Agreed. 100%. Yeah. Thanks, Alex. Andrew. Yeah. I was just going to say, like, from my perspective, the big barrier, I think, the management update seems like management in a lot of cases being stuck in reactivity mm -hmm. where yeah. and it's like and it's more the case for genomics because once you're working with that it's you know like you're taking a proactive approach to things but there's a lot of managers and management you know agencies that are stuck where they can't even get there so mm -hmm. i think the eDNA is more appealing to them that's the sense i get right now because that has the potential to open things up for them to start you know, getting proactive and using the genomic stuff, but as long as they're stuck in this, like, we're just trying to get around and figure out how many are here, how many are there, what a lot of them, I think, are likely to say when, you know, someone comes to them with, like, a new genomic tool is like, well, like, what, what does this do for me, or what, what can I do based on the information that I get back from this about some people's stress in the system? Like, you know, if I get, information back that suggests like the housing development is impacting this broker stream this way. Like I have no control over that. What do I do with it? Mm -hmm. So that, that's just something I've been mulling yeah. over this whole time. And what Dr. Heath just said about yeah, the, the original idea that, that you look at long-term things and you monitor with eDNA and then you go in and use genomic 
more acute and you just I'd like to kind of clarify that as well. Yeah, I was going to ask you a question yesterday and we ran out of time, but in all your interviews with the 50 fisheries managers, was there ever space there where they talked about health no, or was it always no, numbers? No, that's, that's exactly why. Like it's, yeah. like when I ask something like, what do you lose most of your resources time to do? It's, it's, I, I have to count somewhere, but something like 40 out of 50 say just monitoring populations yeah. for a month. Like that. Yeah. So for those of you also work with, with your partners, that are in government or or NGOs, is it numbers? Is it health? What's the sense of what you get, Daniel? I would say it depends upon partners. Yeah. So like Corey Fishery Bells managers, yeah. in environmental monitoring for mine tailing, they're very interested in health. <laughs> yeah. You know, is the selenium actually damaging the fish? Or if it is, how much? Mm -hmm. And then aquaculture or uh, provincial fish actions yeah. are very interesting. So the work that you did with Ken uh, that you showed us, uh, well, that was a contaminant one? Was that, what fish was that? And then Margaret and Bob were involved in that with the First Nations. Ken, you did? Yeah, Ken, was that health? That was health related, right? They were interested? Yeah, it was just sort of a, a general interest in how the fish are doing. Um, they have a long-term monitoring program for uh, persistent organic pollutants mm. in the tissues there. Right. The environment Canada it is downstream of the, of the oil sands. And yeah. so it's sort of an idea that perhaps we could use transcriptional profiling to look at whether the fish themselves are actually responding to any of the contaminants that might be in the environment as opposed to just monitoring how many of them are in the tissues themselves. Yeah, yeah. So you're right, it's definitely con like sector dependent. But fisheries managers is a huge target for us. And so if it's not even there, it's not even on the table, it's going to be difficult to sell potentially. I'm going to get you, Declan, first. Uh, That's fine. I can yeah. just say that. Yeah. Okay, thanks, Scott. Uh, I'm just going to say, um, I wonder how much of a link there is that people that make the assumption that we're focused on numbers, and they're like, as long as the numbers are going up, saying that all the fish are healthy. Mm -hmm. I wonder if there's that assumption being made that unless it's going down, we don't care. Yeah. And that's kind of, I would imagine, where a lot of this would stem from. So they might not directly think of health, but actually they're in it, like, subconsciously they've already considered that as a, the number the stable. Yeah. I have something. That, yeah, so I'm thinking now about that Bruce nuclear power plant project. And since it's starting up, maybe numbers aren't going to be affected, but is there anything that's going to be, a, like, any kind of stressor on them ahead of the time that might precede a decline? I can think of that in terms of new development, but... Nick, what are, what are your thoughts on that? Because I know it's EDNA, uh, and that you and Alex were working on, or who was your student? Sorry. Yeah, it was. Uh, but in the absence of that, what about health? Yeah. Because well, it's heat. Don't they use, don't they, like? Well, yeah. Well, I've had a whole separate discussion about them and thermal yeah. issues. Yeah. There, there's a lot there. Uh, I, I think they want, I think they want to be convinced based on what we're doing now, and then mm. there's a lot of areas to expand into. Yeah, OK. Um, yeah, but right now it's like absolute numbers is the, is the big issue, right? Because they have to yeah. watch that back. Yeah, yeah, that's true. They okay. were interested in fish health, um, both from a different perspective, in that they consider probably a lot of fish that were brought in to be a poor health, which then does that mean a different kind of offsetting strategy for them if they're sucking in primarily unhealthy fish that mm -hmm. may not be as important for the greater level of fish community. So that's kind of a, a totally different. So it was selective. It was well, a selective entrainment. Only the poor conditioned ones would get. They yeah. already get poor conditioned because they were sucked in. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Interesting. Yeah. Kind of, they could use it to cover fish. their butts. Oh, look, they're bad they fish. Kind of cool and they all die. So the, the, actually the heat from the yeah. other side is a totally different question than what we had. I gotcha. And then related to that, so one of the reasons uh, NAWASH is doing Markel's project is because they're concerned about the, the health of wetlands and how they may be, may be impacted. So we're looking at that through fish community composition in the wetland index, but there's there's likely a more direct way of doing that. But you know, so the first step is developing the index, and then if you see variation in that, then maybe you skip the community step and you go straight to the you know the indicator. The, specific, you know, the fat head mental indicator stuff or something like that. Yeah, right? yeah. So I can, coming back to Daniel's point, there could be a, a nice 
I don't know, intersection between the two. So that's not one or the other. Scott, your thoughts? Uh, well, it's, it doesn't, it's a little bit uh, circling back. I was yeah. just uh, surprised, Daniel, that you said uh, $18 seems expensive. <laughs> I mean, can you get a meal for two at McDonald's for eighteen dollars anymore? I, don't, I mean, to me, like this is something that's totally invisible that you can now get information on, and it's hugely valuable. Like to me, like the way you talk about it, it's the uh, end user is going to pick up on that, you know. So if you could trade, oh, this is pretty expensive, you know. I don't know. Uh, they're going to maybe think that and um I, I think that sounds like a bargain quite frankly scott you're gonna do our videos <laughs> you're like it's a bargain people 18 dollars yeah. nick's gonna be selling already hot fried fish from the power plant <laughs> like cook through yeah scott will have like a big uh big back meal in front of him <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah you just wouldn't want to eat this fish it's scored high on those contaminants yeah. Yeah, Margaret. I think it's all, it, it really emphasizes the complementarity of different sources of information. And, and like, so that it's yeah. seen whether you're looking at total abundance or whether you're looking at um, age class structure to look at, see, okay, well, maybe there's indications of recruitment failure that then yeah. sort of triggers the desire to look at, uh, do the transcriptional profile for gene split for reproduction or something like that, like that it's not necessarily not a one-size-fits-all. Yeah. You have to do this. This this is better than conventional. It depends on the, the question. I think this is why the the, the the decision support tool is so important to be able yeah. to. Um, this is our question. What tools would, given our budget, given our needs, help uh, us uh, address them best? Yeah, that's a really good point. Budget and needs. Exactly. I think that's going to be the two big ones as the determinant. Declan. So there's something else to consider in terms of kind of rounding back into the cost side of things. You could market this to, uh, I know the celebrity in the Great Lakes side of things, they're going to have this thrown at them quite aggressively, as we already said. You can market this as a, if you're already doing a survey, if you're already doing some sort of study with fish or something you're intrigued in, why not tack this on? Mm -hmm. And as long as you can like allow the, that uptake to be relatively simple mm -hmm. and the, like the, some sort of relevant outcome there, they can link things together. That's a good opportunity, yeah. rather than saying go out, spend all this money, all your manpower to go out and collect these transcript, like these samples, tack it on to something you're already doing, and then it's not so mm -hmm. maybe the cost isn't so bad at that point. It's eighteen. And then the other issue is how many samples. Again, that's the minimum sample level, and then what you're looking for. Like, if you're taking muscle and gill, then obviously, like, you're running two separate things, then the price goes up again. Yeah, do you want to do fin clips as well? Are you going to do bloods? So, like, you can suddenly ramp up a cost depending on how much you have to pay. Yeah, yeah. We need those cost numbers, John. I think that's going to be really important. Yeah. I mean, Scott. I think with the groups I work with, it's almost always tacked on like that. There's a watershed group that has two or three full-time field employees, and they look for, you know, they plan out their next summer, and then they apply for, you know, these small grants that are between three and ten thousand dollars, and that's where they oh, yeah. buy the lab services. But they're already kind of going. They've already got dedicated field employees to go out and do this stuff, mm -hmm. you know. And so mm -hmm. I think it fits within a lot of budgets. For nonprofits, you know, all of this stuff does. So there's money to actually run the samples, but then the money to charge to create the reports. So that's where the software comes in. Yeah, okay. And then who's gonna look at that and analyze it to make sure that before it goes out, it actually is reporting the right things and the right interpretation. So quality control after the report has been generated. Who does that and how much because that's that's going to be expensive because that's someone's expertise we need to pay for. My guess is the $18 per fish would include quality control. Gotcha. So like when John runs a chip, he gets information that the end user doesn't want to know about how the run went. And 
that will inform the operator that, okay, the, the sample was degraded or the run didn't work. Yeah. So if you include interpretation, the cost goes through the roof. So like when I can work with consulting companies and they want ETNA work done, I say, sure, we'll send you the data. And they say, okay, now we want you to analyze this. That's okay, now that's going to cost. So same thing with the EDNA then. So we need that kind of cost built in on both sides for both chips. Is that in, because we need to interpret it. You can't automate that. I, I mean, no. Mm -hmm. So Nature Metrics is a sort of fee-for-service company doing this. They charge $600 a sample to do EDNA metabarco. And if you want a report, that's like a like five grand. Really? Did you tell that to Trevor? We we're talking about commercialization <laughs> before. So what is it called again, Bob? Nature Medfix. Okay. Nature Medfix? Okay. Now I can see a consulting company doing transcriptional profile. And I can see cottagers being interested. You know, they catch a, a sunfish. Well, wonder if our sunfish, you know, send it off and pay $100 mm -hmm. and get a heart health report on their fish that they caught. Yeah. Oh. How, how would they know about it, though? How did we find out about Ancestry.ca or 23andMe? Uh, yeah. Because <laughs> you don't want to be related to that sunfish. <laughs> yeah. Any other comments or questions or opinions about this? Well, you're all here, so you're still invested. So, yeah. Look, Margaret and I were talking at lunch, and I want to repeat this to this room. When we get together and we talk about what we've accomplished, it's bloody impressive. Yes. No, it really is when you, the, 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 the uh, concatenation of all the student projects and the- and Come up here and say it, in front of uh, the camera here. <laughs> I'm gonna see it again. This right? is your closing, this is okay, your closing. This is the closing. Yeah. Yeah, so. As scientists, I find we often are worried about the limitations of what we're doing and about the things that didn't work. They tend to be the ones that really jump up at you when you're waking up at night and thinking the open array only goes to 32 cycles. <laughs> um, that, one, that one kept me up a bit. Uh, but my point is that when, you get, when we get together, we've got tremendous expertise in this group. And we've accomplished an enormous amount. When you think about, we went, this thing coincided with COVID, right? We started in January of 2020. And what was it, two and a half months and we were shut down. So it's pretty impressive what we've accomplished. And, you know, Ken and I were talking about the fact that activity three and four, just watch it take off in the next year. Because you know those chips are starting to come through and they're starting to be validated. They're starting to generate real data, like Riley's work on the, the yellow perch and the sound pollution. Um, so I'm, I think this is going to be a resounding success. And to hell with the ROC. <laughs> but anyways, thanks very much for everybody, and uh, we can hang around and, and chat further. Or those of you who have to catch planes or hit the 401. Thanks very much for the effort, and uh, I'm still trying to persuade Joe that our next annual general meeting is going to be at Kananaskis. <laughs> we need so, more money. Yeah, that's it. But I just want to thank Paige, Keta, right, for the amazing audiovisual keeping us on track and all the hard work. It's kind of stressful to do that too. <laughs> And the setup of the AGM was an, was an enormous amount of work. Logistics flowed so smoothly, and this, you know, Joe and Kenna and uh, Paige all had to work really hard to make things come together in the, as smooth a fashion as they did. So, to all of you for that as well. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. And I, is there anything else? Okay, thanks very much. Okay.